Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we are excited to bring to you our tutorial on explaining machine learning predictions. I am Himala Karaju. I am Julia Sarebayo. And I'm Samir Singh. Um, I hope you find this tutorial useful and insightful. Uh, we have slides and videos available at the URL on this slide. Um, so let's begin. Machine learning models are being increasingly employed in a variety of real world settings. For example, machine learning models are being used to assess decision makers like doctors and judges in domains like criminal justice and healthcare. They're also being used to determine which applicants actually get their loans approved. In addition, machine learning models are powering recommender systems across a variety of popular platforms, including Facebook, Amazon, Goodreads, and many, many more. So basically, machine learning is everywhere today. Now, the next big question that we need to ask ourselves is in which of these settings is model understanding really crucial? And model understanding can be absolutely critical, particularly in those domains and applications which involve high stakes decisions that impact the lives of millions of individuals. Examples of such domains include healthcare, medicine, criminal justice, financial lending, and many more. Now let's try to probe a little bit more deeper to really understand what exactly can model understanding help enable. To do this, let's consider some concrete examples. So let's take this example where we have an image which is input to a predictive model and the predictive model correctly labels this image as a Siberian Husky. Now, if we dig deeper and we try to understand how the model is making this prediction, we might realize that the model is actually using the snow in the image to tag this image as a Siberian Husky. So this revelation has basically helped us understand that the model is relying on incorrect or spurious features when making this prediction. And we might need to go back and debug this model and improve it further. So model understanding in this case facilitates debugging. Now let's consider another example scenario where we have a bunch of information about a particular defendant, including her previous crime records, socioeconomic information, and so on. When this information is passed through a predictive model, the model might output a prediction which says this defendant is too risky to release. Now, if there is a judge who is trying to see if and how to leverage this prediction, the judge might not really get too much information from this singular prediction. On the other hand, if we provide a deeper understanding, for example, if we tell the judge what are the important features that the model is using when making this prediction, and in this case, the, that happens unfortunately to be features like race and gender, the judge might realize very quickly that this prediction is biased because the model is using features like race and gender when making this prediction and the judge will most definitely disregard this kind of a prediction and will make his own decision in this particular case. So in this scenario, model understanding is facilitating bias detection. Now let's consider another concrete example where we have an applicant who has just applied for a loan. Now, all the details of this applicant are being parsed by a predictive model, which in turn deems that this applicant is not ready for a loan and denies his loan. Now, instead of just telling the applicant that his loan has been denied, it can be super helpful to provide the applicant with more information. For example, to tell him about what aspects of his profile or application can he change to improve the chances of him getting a loan in the future. For example, in this case, we might tell the applicant that he should increase his salary by 50K and pay his credit card bills on time for the next three months in order to get a loan in the future. This will basically provide the applicant with a deeper understanding of what he can do and what he can work on. <laughs> 
So model understanding in this case helps provide recourses to individuals who are adversely affected by model predictions. Now let's consider another scenario where we have a bunch of patient data and the corresponding predictions as to if a patient is healthy or sick, which are output by a predictive model. Let's say there is a doctor who is looking at these predictions. She may not be sure if and when and by how much to trust these predictions. Now, if we provide her with a deeper understanding of what the model might be doing, in this case, the model might actually be using ID numbers to make predictions on female subpopulations, but it might be using the apt features like if a person has cold and cough when determining uh, if a male patient is sick or not. If the doctor sees this and has this deeper understanding, then she can quickly realize that the model is using irrelevant features when making predictions on female subpopulation, and therefore she cannot trust its predictions for that particular sub group at least. So in this case, model understanding helps assess if and when one should trust model predictions when making decisions. Now let's consider the other side of the same scenario where a regulatory agency is trying to determine if this model that we just saw is actually suitable for a more wider large-scale deployment. And looking at the deeper understanding or looking at the explanation that we have of the model, the regulatory authorities quickly realize that this model is using irrelevant features like ID numbers when making predictions on female subpopulation and therefore is not really suitable for wider deployment at this time. So in this case, model understanding has allowed us or the regulatory authorities to wet models to determine if they're suitable for deployment in the real world. So model understanding is actually enabling a ton of use cases, including debugging, bias detection, providing recourses. It's also helping us understand if and when to trust model predictions and also helping us wet models to assess their suitability for deployment. In enabling all these use cases, model understanding is actually serving a variety of stakeholders, including end users, for example, loan applicants, decision makers like doctors and judges, regulatory agencies like FDA, and also researchers and engineers to help better debug their models and make them better. Given that model understanding is enabling so many use cases, let's now turn to another question, which is how do we actually achieve model understanding? To this end, previous work has basically proposed two prominent approaches. The first approach is to basically build models that are inherently interpretable. For example, models like linear models or shallow decision trees or other rule-based models, which are often considered interpretable as humans can actually look at these models and make inferences about how the models are making their predictions, right? The second approach to achieve model understanding is to basically explain pre-built models in a post hoc manner. For example, let's say we either have a black box model or we have a very complex model like a deep neural network with several tens or hundreds of layers. These kinds of models can be passed on as inputs to explanation algorithms or explainers, which in turn uh, produce explanations in the form of either linear models or shallow decision trees or other rule-based models or even visualizations so that these give a more interpretable understanding to the end users, right? So these are the two approaches that previous literature has advocated for. Now, the next big question is to basically think about when to use which of these approaches. So when to basically go for inherently interpretable models versus when to go for post hoc explanations. To answer this question, let us basically consider an example. Let's say we are in a setting where accuracy interpretability trade-offs are actually existing. For example, what we observe is that as we make our models more and more complex, we are able to get higher and higher predictive accuracy. 
for example, when we were using linear regression or decision trees, maybe accuracy is taking a hit. On the other hand, when we basically use more complex models like random forests or deep neural networks, our predictive accuracies are improving, right? So these patterns can actually commonly observed in certain settings, especially in things like image recognition and so on, okay? So now there are certain settings where these trade-offs exist. And in those cases, we might not want to sacrifice accuracy for the sake of interpretability. And in such cases, we may want to rely upon post hoc explanations. To get a deeper understanding or intuition about when we might encounter these settings, let us now consider another example. So what you see here is actually a two-dimensional scatter plot of a data set. The data set just has two dimensions. On the x-axis, we plot dimension one. On the y-axis, we plot dimension two. And what you see is just a scatter plot of the data points there. And as you can see here, this data is actually linearly separable, which means we can actually build a simple interpretable linear model uh, in this case, which will also be pretty accurate because the data itself is lending itself very naturally uh, to these kinds of models, right? Because the data is linearly separable. Now let's consider another case or another scenario where the data has very complex nonlinear decision boundaries. In this case, simpler models like linear models may not really be able to capture these complex boundaries correctly, and we may need to resort to using more complex models for the sake of predictive accuracy. Right? So in this case, there is clearly a trade-off between going for interpretability versus accuracy because complex models might achieve higher accuracies. And in such cases, we might resort to using post hoc explanations. Okay. And there is also the scenario where sometimes you just don't have enough data to build a model from scratch, right? All you have is that you are just stuck with a proprietary black box. And in that case also, we might want to resort to post hoc explanations because there is pretty much no other option. Now, in summary, what we would like to emphasize on is that if you can build an interpretable model, which is also adequately accurate for your setting, please do it. Otherwise, post hoc explanations can come to your rescue. And this tutorial will focus on post hoc explanations. So one way to define what an explanation is, is to say the following. An explanation is any interpretable description um, of the model behavior. So let's see kind of what this actually means. Um, on one end, you have your classifier with some really complex surface. That's the that's what the model is doing implicitly, and you may not be able to express this directly. On the other hand, you have a user who's trying to consume uh, and, and try to understand this classifier. And so the explanation is the thing that is, is in between these two, right? Uh, it's trying to give the user an understanding of what the classifier is doing. So there are sort of two goals that an explanation should have. One thing is that it should be faithful to the classifier. So it should not express things that are completely off. Um, and of course, faithful can, can depend on, on specific use cases, um, but it should also be understandable by the user. So again, understandable depends on the user, depends on the specific domain, uh, but these both of these things have to be true to a large degree for any explanation to be a valid explanation. Um, so given this definition, there are many, many different things that can fit into this, this sort of description, right? Uh, one thing you can do as well, I'm going to send all my model parameters to the user. And maybe that sometimes makes sense if you can guarantee that they will be understandable, uh, but often not, right? Um, you can also give them examples of lots of predictions. And that's also in a sense an explanation. Is that the most effective explanation of what the model is doing? Maybe, maybe not but it might be the most faithful one. Uh, you can summarize it with a program or a rule or a tree, and we're going to be seeing some examples of that. Um, you can select most important features, select most important points. You'll be seeing a lot of that. Um, describe how to flip the model prediction. Maybe that's another way to describe the behavior of the model to the user. 
and so on, right? So there are lots and lots of um, different ways to do this. And I'll point you to Zach Lipton's paper uh, from a couple of years ago um, that sort of talks a little bit about what is interpretable, what is not, which is a key aspect of what makes a good explanation and what doesn't. Um, another aspect that we're going to be focusing a lot more is uh, contrasting local versus global explanation, right? So the explanation behavior that I talked about right now is to describe the whole classifier. So if your classifier is some really complex surface like this, your explanation is still responsible for explaining all of it. Um, but sometimes it just might be way too complicate to communicate. Um, instead, what we do is we take uh, a data instance and think about explaining just the behavior of the model for that instance. So what that means is you put the instance um, somewhere in this sort of classifier surface. And instead of trying to describe the whole behavior, you sort of zoom in to some local region that you define um, as being interesting. And you describe the behavior only in that region. So you saw that that complex classifier suddenly is looking a lot simpler when we have zoomed in enough. And so if you have to put a de definition for what a local explanation is, it's pretty much the same thing, an interpretable description of the model behavior uh, with the caveat that it has to be in a target neighborhood. And that's what makes it local. So let's take this definition and see what fits and what doesn't fit into the um, definition of this local explanation. And turns out all different ways of communicating that we had earlier, like sending many examples, summarizing it with a program, all of them sort of translate pretty much to the local setting as well. So all of them could be local if what they're trying to do is describe a target neighborhood. Um, so I'll just sort of conclude a little bit with contrasting these two things a little bit more again. And of course, there's a spectrum. You can increase the neighborhood of local and make it global and things like that. Uh, but at a high level, what local explanations are trying to do is to explain individual predictions, whereas global explanations are trying to explain the complete behavior of the model. Local explanations tend to be a lot more useful for unearthing biases in local neighborhoods um, of a given instances. So why did this, was this instance predicted to be a certain way? Whereas global explanations shed light on sort of the big picture biases that sort of are pervasive to the whole, throughout the whole model. And finally, um, local explanations can be useful for vetting individual predictions, whether they are being made for the right reasons or not. Um, whereas global explanations can be useful to help vet the whole model, right? Whether the whole model is suitable for deployment or not. So that's sort of an higher level overview of what post hoc uh, explanations look like, why they, why we use them, why we need them, and wh what are the sort of different um, ways to describe what, what they explain. Um, and for the rest of the tutorial, we're going to be focusing on these five sections. We're going to start with a uh, overview of what are the different approaches that are out there and examples and lots of examples of what these explanations look like. We'll talk about some of the challenges that arise from using these explanations to describe different data modalities. So images versus tabular versus text and so on. Uh, we'll talk a lot about how we evaluate these explanations and how the current state of the art evaluates them. Uh, what are the sort of limits uh, of post-hoc explainability that we know of right now? and look forward towards a bunch of ideas in future um, where we think the research in postdoc explainability is going. Welcome to the first section of this tutorial where we're going to be talking about approaches for postdoc uh, explainability. Uh, this is mostly just to get you a little bit familiar with what are the techniques that are commonly used uh, in this literature and give you an, sort of an idea about um, how these things work. All right. So in this section, we're going to be covering a lot of methods. And this is sort of the structure that we'll be following a little bit. Uh, we'll cover a bunch of methods that are um, local explanations, uh, which we just sort of differentiated from global explanations, consisting of feature importances, rule-based saliency maps, prototypes, and counterfactuals. And then talk a little bit about global explanations uh, and different ways that people have constructed those. All right, so let's st start with feature importances. And feature importance is a little bit similar to saliency map, but I'm going to differentiate it a little bit here because methodologically they work differently. 
the the techniques that i'm going to be talking in this section are all what we call model agnostic or you can even think of them as black box techniques the idea is that uh, you you'll have the machine learning model the classifier um, but you won't have any access to the internal structure right so you give a data point you call the method and you get some decision out uh, more specifically you can assume that you get the probability out but maybe nothing more than that right and there are methods that we will see later that use gradients and things like that. But for now, we'll only look at cases where we don't. So why do we want to do this? Why do we want to not assume we don't have access to the internals? Um, the main reason is because it doesn't uh, restrict. It sort of makes sure that your explainability method is not restricted to any specific model. Um, it's also practically very easy. It's not tied to any specific library or code base or anything like that. Um, you can use it pretty much um, across any model. Um, and what is most interesting is you can also do explanations for models that you just don't have access to. So you just have REST API access, you make certain calls and you get an explanation. Uh, you can do that in, in this paradigm. Um, so the first method we're gonna look at that does uh, something like this, that does the local explanations is called line, um, where the idea is you have this local region that you're looking at. You want to approximate this local region with a line essentially. And it's a sparse line where you zero out as many features as possible. And the intuition behind why we do this is because this line in some sense identifies what are the important dimensions for the classifier and presents their relative importance. So the identifying important dimensions is the sparse part of it and the relative importance is linear. Okay, so how does it actually work? I'm just gonna sort of describe what this algorithm, how, how this line explanations are generated in using an example. So suppose you're given an image um, of a dog playing a guitar and you ask a model, what is the probability that this is a Labrador? The model comes back and says, oh, 21% uh, chance that this is a Labrador. That's the model prediction. You want to explain why does the model think this is a Labrador? The way Lime works is it takes this image and creates a bunch of perturbations, right? So it's gonna change the image in a certain way and it's going to call the model and see what the output probability is. So here is an example of what a perturbation might look like. You're hiding parts of the image. You run the classifier on it and you see what's the probability of Labrador. It's gone up to 0.92. Um, you make another perturbation and you call the model again. And it's like 0 0.001. Uh, you run the perturbation again and call the model and it's 0.34. Right? And so you're getting all of these probabilities for each of these perturbations. And in some sense, you do this hundreds or thousands of times. So you have this mini data set specific to the single image where you have perturb indices, uh, instances and what the model output was. Given this mini data set, you run some kind of locally weighted regression uh, with some sparsity cons uh, constraints on it in order to try and fit what changes lead to the model prediction to change as well. And in the end, what you get is an explanation because you have a coefficient for each part of the image. Um, and so this one is identifying that the model thinks this image is a Labrador because of what's going on with the face and maybe a little bit of what's going on with the leg area. So this is essentially how Lime works, right? And Lime is great um, at generating these kind of explanations, uh, partly because it's extremely customizable. Right? That's, that's sort of the key aspect of design in Lime. Um, so for example, things like how do we perturb the instance, right? Is, is something that the user can specify or can change, which makes it easy to apply it to all kinds of domains, right? You can perturb images in a certain way. You can perturb text in a different way. You can perturb tables in a different way again. Uh, and you can use Lime for that reason. Apart from um, perturbation, there is also this idea of similarity as to what things are close to each other, what things are further from each other, and you can sort of specify that in Lime as well. You can also specify how local do you want the explanation to be, so how much are you going to weight things that are closer higher and weight things that are further away lower. And finally, how do we even express the explanation? Do you want it to be in terms of pixels or super pixels or 
anything else um, can be completely changed in Lime. Right? So Lime is therefore quite flexible and can be used in many different cases. Of course, you can argue that this level of customizability is maybe a problem with Lime as well. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in, in the limitations aspect. Uh, but if you start thinking of all of these choices as hyperparameters, uh, you can imagine there's a hyperparameter search involved here to get the right explanation, and it gets a little bit messy in that case. Here's an example um, that sort of, you know, was in the original paper that highlights what Lime could potentially be useful for. Uh, so suppose you've trained a classifier that tries to differentiate between wolves and huskies, and husky is a breed of dogs. Um, and you know, like these are six examples, and you can see the model is actually quite good um, at differentiating wolves and huskies. It only makes this one mistake in these six examples. If you want to know what it is actually doing, just by looking at these examples, it's not quite clear. Um, maybe you can conjure up what's actually happening, but you wouldn't be sure. Um, and here are what the Lime explanations look like for all of these images. Again, the gray area is the part that the model is not looking at um, according to Lime. And the non-gray area is the part that the model is focusing on. So instead of looking at all explanations, it might be useful to only look at the ones where the model predicts it's a wolf. And you can see in all of these explanations, the, the actual animal seems to be hidden. Um, and you can see mostly snow in the Lyme explanations. Um, and this would sort of verify what your uh, intuition might be, that essentially this is not so much a wolf versus husky separator. It's more of a snow detector. Every time it detects snow, it predicts wolf. And every time it doesn't detect snow, it predicts husky, right? And that also explains that mistake that the model made. It just happens to be a husky in a snowy region uh, and the model predicts it to be wolf because it's not even looking at the animal, it's just looking at the snow. Okay, um, so that, that's sort of an example of how Lime works and, and what kind of explanations it produces. Uh, there is also a related method um, called SHAP, which is sort of shapely values as importance. The idea here is it's intuitively similar to Lime, where you're perturbing instances and seeing which features lead to uh, change in the output. But the, the main difference is that you're computing a marginal contribution of each feature uh, towards the prediction. And so in order to compute this marginal co contribution, you have to go over all possible permutations of the features and see in every instance that it participates, how much effect does it have on the output. Um, so I've given an example here where you have some permutation of features O, uh, which has Xi turned on, um, and that produces some probability. You also have uh, the same permutation O without Xi being on, um, and you have some probability. That difference ends up being the contribution of Xi for this permutation. Um, so that's the marginal contribution of Xi in this permutation, which happens to be 0.1. Uh, if you aggregate this across all possible um, permutations, you get the marginal contribution of Xi for the prediction, the average marginal co contribution. Um, there is theory here to suggest that this is much more fair. This is the fair way of attributing predictions to specific features, which is kind of what you want from feature importances. So there's a lot of literature here. There are the literature connecting SHAP to Lime, problems with SHA, problems with Lime, and we're not going to go in, into all of that, uh, but it's useful to know that there are these two different ways of uh, looking at the same thing. Okay, so that's all I have for feature importances. I quickly want to give an example of how some of these ideas can be extended beyond feature importances to something that's a little bit more rule-based and in some sense, a little bit uh, more precise and more actionable. So, we are going to talk about anchors now. Um, the idea here is that it's possible even in your local region, the decision surface is not very linear. Maybe it looks like this curvy thing. Um, how can you express uh, explanation in this case? Um, so what anchors does is it specifies it using a sufficient condition. What that means is it's going to be a rule, which is going to look like a square because it's sort of constraints on features. Um, in which the prediction doesn't change. Right? So in other words, what we are trying to do here is identify the conditions under which the classifier has the same prediction. 
this ends up being a complicated combinatorial uh, problem and and there are approximations that people use to make this efficient and essentially uh, sample in this space till you are very confident that your rule uh, isn't is a sufficient condition for the model to have that prediction it's not quite intuitive what happens here so let's actually give an example of what this anchors look like um, so this is an example of an instance where the goal is, given the demographics of a person, uh, predict whether their salary is higher than 50K or lower than 50K, right? And so this is, there is an instance with a bunch of features, and you can see that the model predicts that the salary is less than 50K with a pretty reasonable confidence, right? Now, if you want to look at the explanation of why the model predicted this, uh, we can look at Lime first, and it produces a explanation that looks like something like this, where it puts the most important features on top and it says whether they have uh, an effect that makes the model think the salary will be less versus effect that makes the model think that the salary will be more. So the fact that capital gain is zero makes the model think the salary will be low. This, the fact that marital status is married makes the model think that the salary will be high and so on. And there are a bunch of small, small things here, but it doesn't quite tell you exactly what's happening. Um, is there something simpler that's happening or is the model actually looking at all of these together to come to a decision? Uh, what can I change? and still have the same prediction, what do I need to change to uh, get to the other side and so on. Whereas anchors in this case gives a very simple explanation. It says if education is um, not beyond high school, um, then predict salary less than 50K. So it's a very simple rule that just tells you condition on one feature. Um, if that condition is true, your salary is going to be less than 50K according to the model, right? Um, and there's a, some confidence that, that we use to generate these explanations. So you can sort of contrast the feature importance-based explanations and rule-based uh, explanations here and see how they can be quite different. And it's not clear one is necessarily better than the other, but you can imagine in different situations, uh, different ones will be better. So that brings me to the end of sort of feature-based importance and rules-based importance uh, based local explanations. So we'll now discuss saliency map techniques, which are a particular kind of feature importance method. So we'll could, the setting we'll consider is that we have a model F theta here. You can think of this as your favorite um, Deep Network, Conception V3, Resonance 50, or VGJ16. And this model is given a prediction of June Cobert on this particular input. One question we might now be interested in answering is, what are the parts of this input that the model relies on in order to give a prediction June Cobert? And one kind of answer we can give is a heat map that shows the relevance of each input dimension towards the output, of, the output prediction of this model. And this is exactly what ceiling CMAP techniques provide. And uh, they often call feature attribution methods or heat maps in the literature. In the rest of this tutorial, we'll essentially just call these methods uh, ceiling CMAP techniques. So before we actually discuss um, ceiling CMAP techniques, let's take a quick look at a linear model because linear models are very instructive and can give us insights that might be able to translate to the deep neural network setting. So let's say we have a model uh, W transpose X where X is in RD, D dimensions. Uh, we can ask a question about the sensitivity. And this question is of the form, how, how much does a unit change in, each input in an input dimension induced in the output? And the answer to this, you can sort of compute the sensitivity um, as a gradient that gives you the essentially the weights of the model. And here the gradient is the input gradient. So you compute a derivative of the output with respect to the input and you essentially get the weight vector. Another form of relevance you can also compute here is to say, answer the question, how can I take the output, why in this case, and apportion it across the dimensions of my input. And here, uh, one answer you can sort of obtain here is to say, I'm going to do an element wise products of the weights times the um, actual feature dimension itself. And so these two notions of relevance, the sensitivity that we just described, which is in the form of the input gradient and the gradient times input here will actually translate into 
the uh, deep neural network setting. So the to sort of set up notation, we'll consider F would be mapping from RD to RC. Think of this as a standard supervised classification setting where C is the number of classes that you have. And then one primitive we'll need here is a F of I, which is a load. You can think of it as a function that maps from the input to a particular scalar, which is a class specific logic. So the logits are the output of your network that you actually feed into the softmax function to get the probabilities that go into your loss. So the first saliency map technique we'll consider is the input gradient. And this is the gradient of the logit, class specific logit, which respect, this is the derivative of the class specific logit with respect to the input. And so this input gradient is an RD, which is the same size as your input. So you can visualize it in the form of a heat map. And there are a few challenges that you can sort of, uh, that you have with this input gradient. One of them is uh, known in the literature as either gradient saturation or sensitivity uh, issue. And here what happens is it's possible for you to go from a, an input to another input. So you could go from a baseline input to another input, which induces a change in F, whereas the gradient does not change. This presumably could be because the function is flat along uh, around the particular input that you're interpreting, or it could be that um, the gradient is just saturated up uh, around that point. So this is a potentially undesirable property of the gradient. So several other methods have been proposed to counteract this. One of them is smooth grad. And so smooth grad is a simple modification of the gradient. So you can think of smooth grad as you have an input you want to explain, you create n copies of this input at Gaussian noise, and then you compute in input gradient for all n copies and average them. This is what SMUGRAD uh, does. And you can visualize the SMUGRAD visualization as shown. And what you observe here is that the input, the saliency map is a little more coherent than the actual um, input gradient saliency map. So let's keep going. We can also consider um, integrated gradients. And here integrated gradients also uh, counteracts the sensitivity issue that you have with the input gradient. And what integrated gradient essentially corresponds to is a path integral from a baseline. So you can think of this baseline as an input where your function um, sort of gives an output that is that you can sort of think of as zero. So it's sort of a generic input that you want to attribute to. So integrated gradient cor uh, corresponds to a path integral from this baseline all the way to an input of interest. And in practice, that usually trend, uh, uh, corresponds to sort of interpolating from the baseline and computing an input gradient for all your different interpolants and summing them up. So here is a visualization of what an integrated gradient sentence map looks, looks like in practice. So another uh, technique is the gradient uh, element wise multiplied by the input. And this is analogous to the input gradient um, multiplied by the input that we saw for the linear model. And so here's a visualization of the gradient uh, element-wise product of, uh, with the input. And one interesting uh, thing here is that several other methods have actually been shown to be equivalent under sp uh, specific settings. So for example, having a ReLU network or zero baseline to the input grade, uh, to the gradient times input. So let's now shift gears a little bit to consider methods that um, are, we'll sort of refer to as modified backup approaches. So what those methods are is, so if you think of the input gradient, you can compute the input gradient by just uh, one sort of uh, issuing one backward pass in your favorite uh, auto diff language. So it's either as a TF, you can call TF gradients, a uh, few calls to backward in PyTorch or even um, your favorite auto diff package, and you can sort of obtain the input gradient. And modified backward approaches, what they do is they modify the back propagation process to compute a different feature relevance using other kinds of rules. So let's say you have a ReLU network and the activation uh, uh, sort of formulation is shown at, at, as follows. When you actually back propagate to a ReLU network, you have to take into account the forward ReLU uh, that you applied originally. And so you can have a method that's called guided backpropagation, which is a saliency map technique. And what this method does is modifies the regular backpropagation approach. And the key modification is that it zeroes out the negative gradients during 
the biopropagation um, iteration. And so um, this simple change actually makes uh, sort of drastic changes in this behavior of the guided biopropsiliency map. And so here's a visualization of the guided biopropsiliency map, and you can see that it's more sparse than the original input gradient that we considered. Another category of methods that belongs in the modified backprop approach is the layer relevance propagation. And so this is a family of methods that are sort of decompose the output. So you can think of the output here as the logic iteratively via back propagation all the way to the input. And like I mentioned, what is different about those approaches is they specify a variety of rules for how you, how you actually backpropagate relevance from the output all the way to the input. And each different rule actually gives you a different saliency map. So we're showing four different rules here, the zero, epsilon rule, and two other rules as well. So given that we've looked at quite a few methods in a sort of rapid succession, let's do a recap. So we considered Lime and SHAP originally. These are surrogate methods that approximate your model around a single input and then explain the approximation. And then we looked at a variety of saliency map techniques like the input gradient, guided backprop, integrated gradient, the gradient elements wise times the input and a variety of different LRP uh, versions as well. While this um, is quite a number of methods, they are actually only a selection of the saliency map techniques that are out there. And we'll refer you to this work by Samek and Montavon um, from earlier this year that gives a pretty nice summary of several different methods in this area. So now that concludes the discussion on the saliency map techniques. Let's do an overview of what we now call prototype or example-based methods. So prototype methods, you can think of these methods as methods that are explain a model with examples. And so these methods can answer questions like what input um, are misclassified in the training, are mislabeled in the training set, or questions like generate a synthetic example that maximally activates a particular neuron, or sort of answer a question of the sort, what kind of input is my model most likely to have a high test loss on? And so one method that we'll actually look uh, a little bit in detail on is training point ranking via influence functions. So this method can answer a question of the sort, which training data points have the most influence on the test loss of this Junko bird example. And so let's say you sort of, um, sort of compute this method, it can give you a ranking on all of, all of your training points according to the influence on the test loss of the Junko bird example you're seeing. And let's say you get an answer of this sort. And these are all Junko bird examples. If you're a model developer to train this model, you can look at these examples and sort of have more confidence in your model that it's relying on sort of um, the right semantic type uh, features in order to determine that this uh, input is a Junko bird. And so these are, these are the ways you can use to sort of diagnose your model. So the influence function is actually a, a classic tool in uh, robust statistics that is used to uh, in regression diagnostics. So it sort of answers the question, what is the influence of a, it helps you answer the question, what is the influence of a particular training point on my parameter setting? So in the schematic that we're showing here, you have on the left, uh, regret, uh, a bunch of data points where we fit uh, a linear regression model. And you can see that because of the outlier red point, the regression uh, fit actually compensates for that and sort of tries to incorporate that in the, in, the, in the model. If you remove this data point and then you refit your regression, your regression line, you see that you actually have a different fit. And here you can say that the outlier point red has a high influence on the regression parameters. And so here, Cook and Weisberg actually um, sort of offered an analytical formula for actually deriving the influence of a data point instead of actually refitting the model without that particular data point. And this is actually a classic tool called Cook's, Cook's Distance that is used very uh, widely in the linear regression literature. And so what Ko and Liang did in a paper from ICML in 2017 is to bring this insight in a very a nice paper to a modern machine learning setting. And so let's say we have ZI in this case that indexes our training set. ZJ is a training point that we want to sort of estimate, we want to sort of estimate the influence of ZJ. And Z test is a test example of interest as well. So in machine learning, we typically um, sort of have a training set and we sort of solve the empirical risk minimization problem. 
and to obtain our parameters. So let's say you do that on the left, you have the traditional uh, ERM solution, let's say theta hat with all your training points. What you can then do on the right is upweight an example ZJ by epsilon, and then recompute your ERM solution theta hat epsilon ZJ. Note here that if you set epsilon to negative one over n, it actually corresponds to removing ZJ and estimating a, 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 an ERM solution that actually is without ZJ. So the influence of ZJ here will be the difference between theta hat and theta hat epsilon ZJ. And so what Ko and Liang, uh, Ko and Liang did in their 2017 paper is to provide analytical uh, formulas for the influence of the training point ZJ on the parameters, which is the negative Hessian inverse here, times the, the, the vector, which corresponds to the, the gradient of the loss with respect to the parameters. And then you can also compute the influence of the training point on the input's test loss. For the particular last point, you can use this sort of computation to then rank all of the training points by their influence on a particular test law, on a particular test example that you're interested in. And so you can use this approach to sort of identify mislabeled examples, possibly diagnose domain mismatch, and even in a, in a, nice, uh, in a nice demonstration to also craft uh, test time, uh, training time training uh, poisoning examples. So there are a few challenges with this approach, actually. Uh, one of them is with respect to scalability. As we all know, deep neural networks have lots of parameters. And, and so computing Hessians for, for these things is usually uh, generally infeasible. So you have to resort to Hessian vector products in order to compute um, the influence. And this can be somewhat tedious in practice. Another issue was raised in a recent paper of Basu et al. this year that showed that uh, the influence approximation can be quite loose for non-convex losses, especially if you have models that are quite um, have several different layers. So there are a few alternatives that have been proposed in the literature. One of them is a representer points by Ye et al. and NURBS in 2018, and another recent work uh, called Tracking by Proti et al. appearing at this NURBS. So that sort of uh, is one, what we've just discussed is one kind of uh, prototype explanation uh, approach. Another paradigm is the activ activation maximization approach. And these approaches, you can think of them as identifying examples that maximally sort of strongly activate a neuron or an intermediate function of interest. They're typically applied to deep neural networks. And there are two sort of approaches for sort of computing this kind of examples. One of them is for you to search in a particular corpus. So search in your training set, a validation set on a user provided corpus and identify examples that actually strongly activate a particular neuron. Another one is to actually synthesize a new example uh, in uh, sort of via gradient descent or an iterative optimization process that maximally activates a particular neuron. So here's a visualization derived from the work of Ola et al. in 2017 that shows both of these approaches. In the first row, we see data set examples that sort of act strongly activate a particular neuron. And then on the bottom row, we see um, sort of synthetic examples that were generated via an iterative optimization process to actually maximize uh, the uh, maximize, act, they're strongly maximize a particular neuron. So these are sort of two approaches that fit under this uh, paradigm as well. So now that concludes our discussion on prototype examples and we'll move to a discussion on counterfactuals. All right, now let's talk about local counterfactual explanations. As machine learning models are being increasingly deployed to make high stakes decisions, it also becomes important to provide recourses to affected individuals. And this is exactly what counterfactual explanations will help us do. So counterfactual explanations uh, give us the following information. They tell us what features need to be changed and by how much to flip a model's prediction. That is, 
to reverse an unfavorable outcome. To understand this better, let us consider a concrete application scenario where an applicant sends his loan application to a bank. And the bank might be using a predictive model, in this case, f of x, to determine which loan applications should be approved and which ones should not. In this particular case, let us consider the scenario where this particular applicant's loan application is rejected by this predictive model. Now, instead of just communicating this rejection decision as it is without any other input, it can be extremely useful to the applicant if we provide more information about what he can change in order to increase the chance of his application getting accepted the next time he applies for a loan. So what we design or what we think of is to basically have these counterfactual generation algorithms which communicate with the predictive models and provide recourses to the end users. For example, in this case, a recourse might look like increase your salary by 50K and pay your credit card bills on time for the next three months to increase your chances of getting your loan application accepted. Okay. All right. Now let's talk a little bit about the intuitions behind how to generate counterfactual explanations. What you see here is basically a simple diagram showing a decision boundary between the positive and the negative classes. Okay. We have an instance X for which we need to find the counterfactual. And the intuitive way in which several algorithms try to do this is by basically making small modifications to X until X crosses the decision boundary or this new version of X crosses the decision boundary and its prediction flips. Okay? Such instance is called as the counterfactual of X. So in this case, you see two points, CF1 and CF2, which are both counterfactuals of X. Okay. And CF1 is obtained by moving X in the direction A, and CF2 is obtained by moving X in the direction B. And as you notice, both CF1 and CF2 are on the positive side of the decision boundary. So both of them are actually valid counterfactuals of X. Okay. A lot of the different algorithms designed to generate counterfactual explanations pretty much differ on two key questions. One is how to choose among the various possible candidate counterfactuals. And the second is how much access is needed to the underlying predictive model when we are trying to determine what the counterfactual would look like. Okay. All right, now let's go and look at some of the uh, most important algorithms which were designed to generate counterfactual explanations. The first algorithm for this problem was proposed by Wachter et al. And they use the simple objective function where the goal is to find a counterfactual x prime for a given instance x in such a way that f of x prime, that is the predictive model's prediction on x prime is actually the desired outcome. And the distance between x and x prime is as small as it can get. Okay. So that was their high level idea of what the objective function would look like. Okay. And as you can see here, the distance metric is a key component of this objective and the choice of the distance metric dictates what kinds of counterfactuals will actually end up being chosen. And Wachter et al employed a normalized Manhattan distance as their distance metric. All right. So in fact, Wachter et al. used a slightly different version of this objective that we just discussed, uh, which is shown on the right-hand side of the slide. Uh, this version of the objective is actually unconstrained, as you can see, and is also differentiable. And they use Adam optimization algorithm with random restarts to solve this objective. So one of the key points to note here is that Wachter et al.'s algorithm requires access to gradients of the underlying predictive model, so it is not dealing with a complete black box. 
All right, so these are some of the counterfactuals output by Wachter et al's algorithm. As you can see, in case of person one, the counterfactual says that if the LSAT score was 34, uh, then the a person would have obtained a desired score, right? And then other things to pay attention to here involve persons three and four, what you actually see is that the counterfactual is asking these people to change their race in order to obtain a desired outcome. And as we all know, it is impossible to act upon these features. Now, how to fix this problem and how to generate counterfactuals which are actually more feasible, that is our next part of the discussion. In fact, Ustin et al. exactly deal with this problem. They rethink the objective function that we saw earlier a bit more, and instead of thinking about minimizing the distance between x and x prime, uh, they take a different approach. They basically introduce a two new pieces in the objective function. One is instead of the distance between x and x prime, they actually consider the cost that one needs to incur to change from x to x prime okay and they try to minimize that particular cost and also if you notice there is another variable introduced which is a a is basically the set of feasible counterfactuals input by the end user for example end users can explicitly say that changes to features like race and gender are not feasible therefore they cannot be valid counterfactuals okay and the cost function uh, that is chosen by Ustin et al's work is actually total log percentile shift and they use this cost function to capture the fact that changes become harder when starting off from a higher percentile value that it is that is it is harder to move from 90th percentile to 95th percentile than it is to move from 50th percentile to 55th percentile so this logic is captured in uh, the log percentile shift which they use as their cost function Okay, Ustin et al. only consider the case where the underlying model is a linear classifier when solving this problem. Okay, and that, as we all know, can be somewhat limiting. Furthermore, their approach actually requires complete access to the linear classifier, which means they need to know the weight vector of the linear classifier. So their approach is not designed to work with black box models. Now, one might ask a question, what if we have a black box or a nonlinear classifier as our underlying model? In that case, there may be a workaround. First, we could generate a local linear model approximation, for example, using an approach like Lime, and then apply Ustin et al's framework on top of it to come up with these counterfactuals. Here is an example of uh, a counterfactual produced for a particular loan applicant using the approach of Ustin et al. As you can see, uh, there are different kinds of changes being recommended to reduce the number of credit cards from five to three, and also to reduce the current debt from $3,250 to $1,000. One thing I would like to point out here is that uh, in this particular context, when we think of the current debt changing, it could also potentially affect other features. And in fact, in a lot of real world settings, changing one feature without affecting another is almost impossible. So how would this really affect counterfactuals or would it affect at all? To understand, let us again consider this scenario and study this more deeply. Okay? Now we gave this loan applicant a recourse which asked him to reduce his current debt from $3,250 to $1,000. Let's say this applicant comes back after an year and says, hey, my current debt has gone down to $1,000, now please give me a loan. But then the predictive model might say that, well, that is true, but your age has also increased by one year and the recourse is therefore no longer valid, sorry. Right? So these kinds of scenarios can definitely occur in practice. So it is extremely important to account for feature interactions when generating counterfactuals. But how do we actually do it? That will be the topic that we discuss now. Mahajan et al. and Karimi et al. propose some solutions to tackle this problem. 
For example, Mahajan et al. propose a new variant of the objective function where instead of the standard distance metric D that we were looking at or using so far, they actually consider a new distance metric denoted by D underscore causal, which leverages the structural causal model in the entire process of generating counterfactuals. To try and understand this metric a little better and to develop an intuition for it, let us consider this example where we have a data set with three features, feature one, two, and three, and what you see on the screen is a causal graph of that data set. What we see here is that feature three has two parents, feature one and feature two, and neither feature one nor feature two actually have any parents in the causal graph. So their approach divides all features into two groups, a group U, which is basically the set of those features or nodes with no parents in the causal graph, and a set V, which is basically the set of those features or nodes with at least one parent in the causal graph. And using this definition, they define this new distance metric where for each feature u for which there is no parent in the causal graph they essentially use the same old standard l1 or l2 distance between the corresponding feature values of the original instance and the counterfactual that is they compute uh, the distance between xu and xu prime Okay. On the other hand, for those features V, uh, which basically have at least one parent in the causal graph, uh, they compute the distance between XV and the expected value of X prime V, given the values of the parents of this particular feature V. Okay. In doing so, they are essentially incorporating the causal structure of the graph into the process of counterfactual generation, which means they're also incorporating the interactions between the features or considering them when generating counterfactuals so that the problems like the ones we just saw do not arise, right? Okay. So their approach, of course, requires knowledge of the full causal graph, which can often be impossible to obtain in practice. But empirically, they show that partial knowledge of the causal graph also seems to work fine. In addition, they propose a workaround uh, where end users can provide inputs about feasibility constraints and the partial causal graph. And in order to solve the proposed objective, they leverage a variational autoencoder. And one thing to note here is that their approach requires access to gradients of the underlying predictive model. Now, other notions of feasible counterfactuals have also been proposed in literature. For example, one notion is based on the idea of data manifold closeness, where the goal is to generate a counterfactual which is actually close to the original data distribution. Uh, this basically uses the intuition that counterfactuals, which are actually very far off from the original data distribution, may not even be valid data points. And another take on what a feasible counterfactual should look like enforces the notion of sparsity by ensuring that we only change a small number of features in the counterfactual, because requiring a user to act upon a large number of features can often be extremely hard in practice. All right. Now we are going to talk about the next type of explanations that is global explanations. Global explanations are designed with the goal of explaining the complete behavior of a given model, which could potentially be a black box. So these kinds of explanations provide a bird's eye view of model behavior. And these explanations help detect big picture model biases, which are persistent across larger subgroups of population and which are often harder to detect by examining local explanations of several instances. 
In that sense, global explanations are actually complementary to local explanations. Just to rejog your memory, while local explanations try to explain the individual predictions of a given model, global explanations try to focus on explaining the complete behavior of the model. And while local explanations help unearth biases in the local vicinity of a given instance, global explanations help shed light on big picture biases which affect larger subgroups in the population. And while local explanations help us wet if individual predictions are being made for the right reasons, global explanations help us wet if a model at a high level is suitable for deployment. Now let's jump into some of the techniques which uh, are proposed in literature to construct global explanations. Let's start with the first approach where a global explanation is seen as a collection of local explanations. All right, the idea here is to basically first generate a local explanation for every instance in the data using one of the approaches that we discussed earlier in this talk. And once we have that, we then pick a subset of K local explanations to constitute the global explanation. And the choices that we really need to make here are what local explanation technique to use and how to choose the subset of K local explanations. Now let's see one of the first algorithms which actually uses this kind of idea or intuition. The algorithm is SP line and it tries to construct global explanations using local feature importances. By now we are all aware that line explains a single prediction or local behavior of a model for a single instance, right? So in this case, this black dot corresponds to a single explanation. And it is quite impossible and extremely hard to examine all possible explanations to understand the global behavior of the model. So instead, SP Lime advocates to pick K explanations to show to the user. And how can we pick these K explanations? These K explanations are picked in such a way that they're representative, that is these explanations summarize the model's global behavior, and they're also not redundant and diverse. So let me explain a bit when I say what I mean uh, by uh, not redundant or diverse. Now let's consider the three dots that you see on the slide here, the red dot, black dot, and blue dot, each of these correspond to an explanation. Let's say that we have already picked the explanation corresponding to the black dot in our into our subset of K local explanations. Once the black dot is picked as one of the explanations, adding the red dot explanation to the set of K local explanations is not going to add much value. In fact, it would be redundant because both the explanations corresponding to black dot and red dot are describing the same decision boundary roughly. On the other hand, if we choose the explanation corresponding to the blue dot, that is not redundant and that provides diversity because it's capturing a different decision boundary. Now, SP Lime formulates this intuition as a submodular optimization problem and greedily picks a subset of K local explanations. And as we can see, this procedure is model agnostic because it does not require access to the internal details of the underlying predictive model. Now, if we repeat the same procedure, but replace line using anchors algorithm, we will obtain a global explanation, which is a subset of K local rule sets because anchors algorithm actually outputs local rule sets. And even this algorithm that is called as SP anchor uh, is going to be model agnostic. So now we'll discuss representation-based explanation approaches. So representation-based explanation approaches are explanation methods that use the intermediate or internal representations from a deep network to provide insights about the kinds of concepts that this network might have learned. So as an example, let's say we have this function F theta, which is a deep network, and it's given that a prediction on this input is a Junko bird. One question we may be interested in is, does the model rely on the green background to determine the classification of the Junko bird? 
and explanation uh, representation based approaches use the internal uh, embeddings or activations of a deep network to be able to identify this to be able to provide an answer to this kind of a question. So if, let's consider a method called network dissection. And here, network dissection in the first stage works by collecting uh, a variety of images that represent concepts of interest. So let's say you're interested in concept tree or a wheel. You collect images of wheels and trees. And then you also collect segmentation maps that indicate where each concept is based in each image. And then in the second stage, you feed these images that contain your concepts of interest into the network and collect activations from different filters on the network for these different images. Now, in the final stage, what you do is you then quantify the alignment between the activations that you've collected and the ground truth images and labels that you have. And with this, you can identify whether a unit encodes, encodes for a particular concept of interest. So you. This method has been applied to several different um, deep networks trained on the places data set or an image net to be able to identify units in this networks that uh, encode for dog, plant, or a variety of different um, a variety of different concepts. There's also been a compositional extension where you can identify a unit in networks that encode for not just a single concept, but a composition of fun uh, concepts like a unit that encodes for skyscraper, lighthouse, or water tower. Another approach we'll talk about is quantitative testing with concept activation vectors that was introduced by Kim et al. ICML in 2018. And this approach sort of measures the sensitivity of a model's prediction with respect to a concept of interest that can be provided by the user. And so here, a question that TCAV can help answer is, let's say your model, you want to find out whether your model relies on stripiness in order to predict that, a Z, that an image contains a zebra. You can sort of use the TCAV approach to diagnose this kind of an issue. So TCAV works by you collect images for a concept of interest. You also collect a different set of images for random concepts that don't contain the concept that you're interested in. You then feed these images into the network and collect activations across different layers for these different images. And then with these activations, you then train a linear model to separate your concept of interest, stripiness in this case, from the random concept. Now you have a linear model that encodes for the concepts of interest. So you can use the weights of this linear model to measure the sensitivity of the model prediction for a particular class on the concepts of interest. And you can compute this via directional derivatives in the direction of the concepts of interest. So TCAV has been applied to Inception V3 and Google Nets and a variety of different methods, a variety of different deep networks to assess uh, their reliance on a variety of different concepts like zebra, ping pong ball, and dumbbell. There's also been extensions of TCAV to regression tasks for medical images, as well as automatic methods to extract concepts from images as part of the TCAV pipeline. So to wrap up our discussion on concept approaches and approaches that use representation methods to provide uh, understanding for deep networks, if you are familiar with the literature on probing in NLP, then some of the descriptions here should be familiar. And I'm going to refer you to a recent tutorial by Belnokov, German, and Pavlik at, IC, at ACL this year. Another, another line of work that should be from, that, should, that sort of connected to this work is work on representational similarity by Ragu et al., Kumblit at all as well. And these lines of work are very similar to some of the works we discussed. And you can see this literature for additional details. And so now this ends the discussion for representational um, methods. Now let's talk about how global explanations can be generated using model distillation. Before we get into the details of individual techniques, let's first get some intuition about what exactly is model distillation. 
let's say we have a predictive model f of x and then we have a data set of instances we can pass this data set of instances as input to the predictive model which will in turn generate the corresponding predictions now if we take these three pieces and provide them as input to an explainer the explainer will in turn generate a simple interpretable model which is optimized to mimic the predictions of f of x and this entire process is called model distillation that is model distillation is the process of approximating a given predictive model which could potentially be a black box using simpler interpretable model which mimics the predictions of this black box or the predictive model okay all right so there are several approaches which actually leverage this intuition and try to generate global explanations. One of those approaches actually uses what is called as generalized additive models as approximations to any given black box model. So this particular approach does not need any access to the internals of the predictive model. All it needs is query access. That is, you throw in a data point and you get a prediction out. Okay, That's the level of access it needs to the predictive model. So it's essentially model agnostic. And the output that it generates is basically a set of shape functions which capture how the outcome variable changes as a function of each of the input variables. Okay? To understand, let's try and zoom in one of these plots that we see in the output of this procedure. What we see here is how the outcome variable, which is bike demand, is changing as a function of the input variable temperature, right? So on the y-axis, we have the bike demand. On the x-axis, we have the temperature. So such kinds of things or plots are called shape functions, and this approach outputs them. Now, how do we actually generate these shape functions? That is, thanks to this generalized additive model formulation, which basically models the outcome variable as follows, which is as a sum of shape functions of individual features and higher order feature interaction terms. Okay. Now, we basically fit such a GAM or such a generalized additive model to the predictions of the black box to obtain the shape functions that we just saw in the previous slides. Now, there have also been approaches which try to approximate a given complex black box model using decision trees. And apart from decision trees, there have also been techniques which try to approximate a given complex black box model using other rule-based models, for example, decision sets. Let's try to blow up this result and see what exactly this looks like. What we have here is that it is a two-level decision set where the outer rules correspond to descriptions of subgroups and the inner rules correspond to what the model might be doing within each of those subgroups. So that constitutes a global explanation. Okay. Uh, this approach also features what is called as customizable decision sets. And let's try and get into understanding what that means. For example, let's say a decision maker wants to ask some big picture questions about model behavior. For example, in this case, a doctor wants to know how the model is behaving across patient subgroups with different values of smoking and exercise. In that case, this approach is able to customize the explanation in such a way that the subgroups are created based on these two features, which is exercise and smoking, so that the doctor can easily find answer to her question. Okay. All right. So now let's take a step back and talk about what is the desiderata or what are the criterion that are required to generate uh, such decision sets as global explanations and how can they be operationalized. Now, the first important criteria in these cases is fidelity, which is to describe the model behavior accurately using the explanation. And this is operationalized by adding a term in the objective, which minimizes the number of instances for which the label assigned by the explanation does not match the model prediction. 
And the second criterion is unambiguity, which means we do not want any contradicting explanations. And to enforce this, we minimize the number of duplicate rules applicable to each instance. And the third criterion is simplicity, where users should be able to look at the explanation and reason about model behavior. And in order to do this, uh, we add a term in the objective, which minimizes the number of conditions in the rules. And we also add constraints on the number of rules and subgroups. Lastly, of course, the last important aspect here is customizability, where users should be able to understand model behavior across various subgroups of interests, as we just saw. And in order to enable that, uh, outer rules are uh, constrained to only comprise of those features which are of interest to the users. Okay? And the complete optimization problem turns out to be non-monotone and submodular with matroid constraints and can be solved using the well-known smooth local search algorithm. All right, now we come to the last part of global explanations, which is summaries of counterfactuals. Before we get into the details of what exactly are summaries of counterfactuals, let's recap our discussion about this loan application scenario where we had a predictive model which would either approve loan applications or reject them. Okay. We also talked a lot about counterfactual generation algorithms, which can actually provide recourses to individuals who are adversely impacted by the predictions of such models. Now let's take a different perspective on this application scenario. Let's say we have a decision maker or regulatory authority who is asking some big picture questions about the recourses, right? So for example, this decision maker or authority might ask how the recourses permitted by this model vary across various racial and gender subgroups and if there are any biases against certain demographics. In order to answer such questions, we need algorithms which can generate global summaries of counterfactuals. And these global summaries can look something like this. If we blow this up, what we see here is again a two level decision set where the outer if then rules correspond to descriptions of subgroups and the inner if then rules actually correspond to the recourse rules. If we notice closely, what we see is that the outer uh, if then rules are customized to the features of interest to the decision maker or the authority. Now, when we look at this global summary, it provides us a clear view of of how recourses are being prescribed to different racial and gender subgroups. And what we notice here is actually alarming. What we see here is that the recourses of this particular model may be biased because it is requiring certain demographics to act upon a lot more features than others. For example, non-Caucasians are being required to change a lot more features to get recourses than Caucasians. And that's a problem because there's a clear bias is there. Now, how do we even generate explanations or global explanations that capture these kinds of summaries? Let's talk a little bit about the underlying desiderata and the optimization problem. The most important criterion required of such summaries is record, recourse correctness. So that is the prescribed recourses should obtain the desirable outcomes. This can be operationalized by adding a term in the objective which minimizes the number of applicants for whom prescribed recourses do not lead to desired outcomes. The second most important criterion is recourse coverage, where ideally all the applicants who have been adversely impacted by model predictions should be provided with recourses. And this can be formulated or operationalized by adding a term in the objective, which minimizes the number of applicants for whom recourse does not exist. And the third criterion is minimal recourse cost. We need to ensure that the prescribed recourses should not be impractical or terribly expensive to act upon. That is, we should not prescribe recourses which involve changing features which are impractical to change or even making changes of the magnitude that are so high that it is again infeasible. So in order to capture this notion, uh, there is 
this idea of basically minimizing total feature costs as well as the magnitude of changes in feature values. And we can add this notion to the objective function. And feature costs can actually compute it using pairwise feature comparison inputs from end users or domain experts. Now, the next important criterion is interpretability of summaries. Summaries that we produce should be readily understandable to stakeholders like decision makers or authorities in this case. In order to enforce this in practice, we can enforce constraints on number of rules, number of conditions in rules, and number of subgroups. Lastly, customizability is another key criterion in this context, and stakeholders should be able to understand model behavior across various subgroups of interest. In order to enforce this, outer rules can be constrained to comprise only of those features that are of interest to the stakeholders. All in all, this optimization problem turns out to be another non-monotone submodular optimization problem with matroid constraints, and this can be solved using the well-known smooth local search algorithm. With this, we come to the end of this discussion on approaches for post hoc explainability. Now let's talk a little bit about explainability in the context of different data modalities. Specifically, let's consider three different data modalities, that is structured data, computer vision, and natural language to understand why we need explainability in each of these cases and what are some unique challenges presented by uh, these data modalities when constructing explanations. Let's start with structured data. Structured data, as the name itself suggests, is basically data in structured form. For example, we could think of this kind of tabular data that you currently see on the slide when we think about structured data. So structured data sets typically comprise of a variety of variables or features. For example, they might comprise of categorical variables. In this case, you see an example of this feature called married, which takes on two values, yes or no, that is one or zero. So typically categorical variables take on values from a finite or a fixed set of values. Okay, so that each instance is basically assigned to a group. All right, the other kinds of variables we commonly encounter in structured data are called ordinal variables. In this case, you see an example of education level, which takes on values one, two, and three. And note that a level of three is typically higher than a level of two and so on. So basically ordinal variables take on values which have a ranked order among them. The last kinds of variables which are pretty prevalent in structured data sets are, of course, numerical variables. And even within that, this can be categorized as either discrete variables or continuous variables. An example of discrete variables that you see here is months with depth, which takes on different values like 0, 3, 4, 1, 5, and so on. Right. So discrete variables are typically those variables which either take on finite values or countably infinite values, for example, like integers or whole numbers and so on. On the other hand, continuous variables are those which typically take on uncountable values, for example, like real valued fields, right? Here in this case, you see that max payment is an example of one such feature or one such field. Okay, so why do we care about explainability in the context of structured data? Well, for two simple reasons. Firstly, a lot of information in various real world settings is available as structured data. Second of all, a lot of applications deal with structured data. For instance, when we think about disease diagnosis and treatment recommendations in the context of healthcare, a lot of fields or data is captured in structured form. For example, we can think of weight, age, symptoms, glucose levels, and so on. 
And when we think about other applications like risk prediction in financial lending, we also see that a lot of information is captured in structured form, for example, credit scores or education levels and so on. And of course, when we think of recommender systems for movies or products, again, information is in structured form where we could think of fields like list of movies that an individual liked in the past. Okay, so what are the challenges posed by structured data when constructing explanation? First of all, different types of variables in the structured data can actually uh, result in different challenges. For example, different types of variables could call for different similarity or perturbation functions when constructing explanations. Note that these similarity or perturbation functions are often important components of algorithms which generate explanations. And secondly, uh, concepts like gradients may not always be meaningful because for example, let's say we have a feature like zip code. In that case, uh, thinking about a gradient or an output of a gradient might not be very meaningful, right? And then we, of course, uh, depending on the task or the domain, data could either be low dimensional or high dimensional and any method that we propose to construct explanations should be able to deal with both of these, right? So in some sense, the methods should be scalable so that they can deal with large scale high dimensional data. And an example of this kind of large scale high dimensional data appears in the context of, again, recommender systems where the data is stored in the form of like these huge matrices, which is like this user times movie uh, matrix, which captures uh, which movies are liked by which of the individual users, right? And that data could be huge. And, you know, it is in structured form. So explainability methods may also need to deal with this kind of high dimensional uh, data sets. Now let's talk a little bit about what kinds of explainability techniques are most useful in the context of structured data. So feature importance based explanations, for example, specifically those generated by perturbation based methods like line and sharp are fairly commonly used alongside structured data. One thing to note here is that saliency maps and other gradient-based methods are not very meaningful in the context of structured data and are therefore less commonly used. To consider an example, let's take the case of a local explanation generated by line in the context of a classification task. The task here is to classify if a given a tumor, a breast tumor is either malignant or benign. So what you see here is a local explanation corresponding to a particular instance or a particular patient in the data. And the label in this case or the prediction given by the model is that the tumor is benign and you see the top four features uh, according to line which are basically driving this prediction. As you can see, certain features like bare nuclei being higher than a value of 7.75 are actually contradicting the prediction, whereas other features like uniformity of cell size or clump thickness being within a certain value are supporting this prediction. So similarly, another example is a local explanations for a different patient, uh, this time who has been labeled with a malignant tumor. Okay. All right. The other kinds of explainability techniques which are again fairly commonly used with structured data are prototype or example-based explanation techniques. Uh, a word of caution here though, prototypes or examples may not always be interpretable in the case of structured data. Uh, for example, consider a case where a prototype or an example that you have or that you're providing as an explanation comprises of 100 feature values, right? In that case, uh, the explanation that you gave is clearly not interpretable. But let's consider this case uh, where we are thinking about a classification task where each patient in the data 
is classified as either being diabetic or not. And then, uh, you know, using the techniques that we discussed in the previous section, we can actually identify instances in the training data which might be driving this prediction. So here you see a list of the top four instances which drive this prediction. And clearly, since the number of features that we are considering here for each prototype is actually quite small, uh, this explanation is interpretable and is providing us with insights. Now, rule-based explanations are, of course, another very, very commonly used explanations when it comes to structured data. Uh, just to give you a few examples, here is a decision set explanation, uh, which is a global explanation, and it approximates a three-layer neural network, right? So what you see is a bunch of if then rules. Now, this is a global explanation. And if you want to get a local explanation to understand how a particular prediction is being made, you need to just drop in an instance or a particular data point through this decision set and get to a specific rule which is satisfied by that instant and instance. And that rule will give you what the local explanation for that instance would be. Okay, so similarly, we could also think of a decision list based explanation. Again, what you see on the right is a global explanation for a three layer neural network model. Uh, and again, if you want a local explanation, you need to look at the specific rules that the instance satisfies, and that will give you your local explanation. All right, the last kinds of explanations, which are again fairly uh, commonly applicable in the context of structured data are counterfactual explanations. So for example, here is a counterfactual for a particular loan applicant whose loan was rejected by an algorithm. You see that several features require some changes. For example, the most recent payment amount was zero and that should be $500 and months with zero balance over the last six months was one and that should be increased to two and so on. Now, similarly, we can also think of global summaries of such counterfactuals as we saw in the previous section. Uh, so what you see on the right hand side here is a global explanation which summarizes the counterfactuals corresponding to different subgroups in the data, like, for example, based on uh, female and foreign worker variables. We'll now discuss applications of explanation methods in the computer vision setting. So here we're showing several future importance approaches applied to the VGG16 model trained on ImageNet. And as you can see, and as we discussed earlier in the methods section, several of those future importance approaches are sort of applied routinely to image tasks. So here we're showing a neuron Shipley method, which is a method that ranks the neurons, in this case, the filters of the Inception V3 model trained on ImageNet. And the visualization you're looking at here is showing um, the top ranked filters, along with the images that positively activate and also images that negatively activate these filters. Moving to medical image setting, here we're showing a saliency mount visualization for an input uh, for a model trained on uh, radiographs. And the task here was to predict bone age. Moving to a different setting, we're showing a contextual decomposition feature in parents for a model trained for skin cancer detection. And interestingly here, the authors also found that penalizing the com contextual decomposition feature in parents uh, explanations during training led to models that were less reliant on spurious correlations. Here we're showing an integrated gradients uh, heat map for a diabetic retinopathy model. And in this case, a study was actually conducted with ophthalmologists and it was found that the heat map helped improve the ophthalmologist performance on grading some of the diabetic retinopathy images. In a different case, we're showing a TCAV model, a TCAV uh, explanation method, which is a concept approach on a diabetic retinopathy model. And so this TCAV concept approach was used to assess the model's reliance on clinically relevant factors. And so to conclude this section, um, there are several challenges that are emerging with the application of explan um, explanation methods, in the, especially in the medical imaging domain. Several explanation methods are developed 
and tailored towards standard architectures on standard data sets. So like VGG16, ResNet50, Inception V3, trained on ImageNet. And for ImageNet compared to a medical domain, as you're seeing in the knee x-ray, ImageNet has images like birds, indoor scenes, outdoor scenes, and scene images tend to be more diverse than medical images in the sense that medical images typically contain images that are sort of focused on the same artifact, but in the same pose, but the condition of the images is what changes. So for example, in the knee x-ray, it could be the condition of the arthritis, of the knee arthritis that changes from one image to another, yet the images tend to be generally homogeneous. And so transferring the uh, explanation techniques to the settings can be problematic and challenging. And so this is sort of work that is being addressed in the literature as well. And with this, we'll end the discussion on application of explanation methods in the computer vision setting. All right, so now we will talk about um, what explanations look like in natural language processing. So why should we care about explanations in natural language processing? Um, the main reason I think is that there is a lot of NLP applications pretty much everywhere, right? So uh, if it's all not already obvious, we have machine translation, social media analysis, hate speech filtering, digital assistance, everything I'm saying will automatically get captioned with NLP as well. Um, but even more fundamentally, I think what's really interesting about NLP is how it's been changing in pretty major ways in the last few years, right? So just going back a couple of years, word embeddings came along and changed a lot of things. And then we had sort of Elmo based models, bird based models, and now GPT two and three and T five and things like that. So a lot of things are changing constantly in, the, in every year um, and, and becoming more complicated in some sense. Um, and so it's, it's useful to be aware of those things, right? Um, also, for me personally, why I really like working in NLP is the gap between what the benchmarks show um, and how good these models actually are is, is quite vast. Um, essentially, lots of question answering tasks and, and benchmarks, um, a lot of classification benchmarks and textual entailment benchmarks make it seem as if these tasks are pretty much solved because the accuracies are really, really high, uh, often higher than humans. Uh, but, but clearly they are not. Um, if you are a little bit more sort of mathematically involved, it also brings up pretty unique and additional challenges um, that we'll talk about um, next. But I think for interpretability, it's, it's a really nice playground to test out your ideas. So some of these challenges also go beyond natural language. So the fact that you have um, any domain that has discrete or, or structured um, inputs um, can, can benefit from a lot of advances in interpretability for NLP. So what are these challenges that I uh, spoke about? Well, the first and the most important challenge that makes it quite different from um, computer vision at least, is that your space of inputs is discrete, which means when you say things like gradients with respect to the input, it's not directly applicable or not as meaningful as it is in computer vision. You can talk about changing the pixels a little bit, uh, but it's not clear what that means when you're talking about text. Um, what does it mean to change the word a little bit? You can change the embedding, but what does it really mean? Also, it's not just the fact that it's a discrete space of inputs, but not all inputs in that discrete space uh, or all combinations of these discrete spaces are well-defined or valid for, for your task, right? So often if you just take random word pieces and put them together, you, you will get uh, random nonsense sentences that may not make any sense to an to a NLP model. Uh, and what you usually want is the input to be grammatical at least, uh, but often not nonsensical, right? Um, because partly the way these NLP models work with pre-training and all of these things, if you give them nonsense, there is no guarantee that what they will produce has to make any sense at all. Right? Think about machine translation or something like that. 
It's also very difficult to write a similarity or a perturbation function. These are some of these things we kind of take for granted when we uh, work in, in the space of math. So there's X and of course you can take the norm of it, or of course you can create an epsilon ball around it and all of these kind of things, which don't quite make sense even at a word level often, but especially at a sentence level, what does perturbing a sentence mean? What does what does it mean for two sentences to be similar? Is that specific to the task or is it uh, not specific to the task? Um, what is also interesting about NLP that sometimes makes it difficult uh, is that the format itself is also not fixed. So not everything is a classification problem, for example. Um, you have all kinds of structured prediction, you're generating text, you're selecting spans in the input and things like that. So when you um, say you want to take an interpretability technique and apply it to NLP, you have to be aware that you're not doing classification anymore and how, how might that work. Uh, and finally, what, what makes it really challenging is that language, most of the tasks we look at in language, uh, they don't lend themselves to simple explanations, right? Like why is a sentiment of a, of a review positive or negative? Well, maybe they say it's a good movie or it's a bad movie and then it's easy, but maybe the sentiment is expressed much more subtly in the words that they use. Um, and none of those things can be easily captured by interpretability techniques. So given all of these things, um, let's look at a few examples of what, what people have done. I'm gonna go and show you just a bunch of examples. Um, first, I'll show you some for what word attribution looks like for NLP. So you can say things like you're doing sentiment analysis. And so here's a review in intelligent fiction about learning through cultural clash. The, the red ones are ones that are making this review seem negative and the blue ones are ones that are making this review seem positive. And so this one is sort of identifying which words in this input leads to which direction, which polarity. You can also do it for question answering, where suppose somebody asked a question, what company won free advertisement due to QuickBooks contest? You want to figure out which word is the most important one here or relatively to other words. And in this case, it seems to be advertisement. Uh, you can also do it for masked language modeling tasks, which are not really downstream tasks. This is something you do uh, before you're doing your NLP, but this can be pretty useful as well. So for example, we are asking here, the blank ran to the emergency room to see her patient. Um, the model actually predicts blank um, to be a nurse rather than a doctor or a, or a woman rather than a doctor. And so you might want to know why does it predict doctor in this blank? Uh, why does it predict nurse in this blank? And it turns out the most important word is her. Um, and so it's sort of using the gender of that, that pronoun to figure out for some reason it thinks it can't be a doctor. Um, here are a few more examples. So here's an example of perturbation based explanations, um, Lime, where the review might be this movie is not bad. Um, when you're breaking down in terms of words, bad is still something that says it's a negative review, but not here is making it positive. So not here acts as a positive word in this case. Um, but of course, if you write a different review where you say this movie is not very good, um, this is a negative review. And in this case, very good are positive, uh, but not acts as a negative, uh, sort of negative polarity. And so it's making this whole review negative. Um, and that's why not acts as a negative here. So it's a very local explanation of what's happening. Here is an example of anchors for the same instance. The, this movie is not bad, the anchor here ends up being not bad uh, together, right? So it's not, it doesn't break it into individual pieces. Um, and those sentences in gray are some of the perturbations that, that are used to figure out that not bad is a positive phrase um, for the model. Here's a nice uh, example I've, I've had for vi visual QA, uh, where you have an image and you say, what is the mustache made of? The model says banana. Uh, turns out the anchor word here is just the word what at the beginning of this question. And so most questions that start with what and have a grammatical structure like this one will have the answer banana according to this model. So you can say things like, what is the ground made of? What is the bed made of? What is this mustache? Blah, blah, blah. And all of the times um, 
uh, the model says banana. And all of these questions are ones anchors uses um, when it's doing this optimization. Here's another example of um, what these explanations might look like um, for sort of more prototype driven stuff. So here's an example of a review, a sometimes tedious film. The classifier for some, time, for some reason thinks it's a positive sentiment. You can look at what the saliency map looks like here uh, and you can see, okay, tedious is negative and film is negative, but sometimes it seems to have a high positive effect on the classification, but it's not quite telling you what's going on here. Instead, you can look at the, uh, the prototype examples, the examples from the most influential examples from the training data, and maybe that will give you some idea. So for example, there is a review called Credulous that has a positive um, prediction and admittedly middling film has a positive label, a simple narrative has a positive label. And you can see like none of these words are exactly, well, there's some words that are exactly the same as the review, but the fact that this review is, you know, negative, uh, but the classifier thinks it's positive can be explained by the fact that there are all these other negative and similar sounding uh, reviews that have been labeled as positive. Okay, so that's all I have for, for the NLP side of things. Uh, here are some useful examples of uh, interpretability techniques that have been implemented in no particular order. Uh, we have some of ours in there as well. Um, and yeah, so I think if, if you're curious about doing NLP and interpretability, I would ask you to uh, check out some of these resources. Um, so that brings us to the end of explanations and how they look like in different modalities. We covered only three of the most popular ones, and I'm sure there are new questions that come up when you switch to other modalities, um, but hopefully this was useful to you. Thank you. All right, uh, let's talk about how we actually evaluate these explanations right now. Um, just to be clear, I'm going to give you a bunch of examples of how people usually evaluate uh, post hoc explanations, but in no way is it going to be completely thorough. So one of the questions that come up is how do we actually evaluate explanations? Um, and there's a paper here that has done a pretty good job of sort of putting it in a taxonomy that we can understand. At the very lowest level are the functionally grounded evaluation. These are ones where you try to test a very specific functionality, but try to sort of automate it as much as possible. So there are no real humans involved in this and the tasks are usually proxy tasks and not exactly the real world tasks. A slightly higher level than that is human grounded evaluation. Um, where you're definitely evaluating with real humans since evaluating interpretability is a big part of it. Uh, but the tasks are a little bit simplified from what you would face in the real world. And the one at the very top is an application grounded evaluation where you take your evaluation and actually deploy it with real humans um, on real tasks that they care about, right? Um, and so at the very low level, you have the cheapest way of doing it. Then you have sort of crowdsourcing or user studies that way you can recruit people all the way to application grounded stuff. Of course, we want to get to the top, but uh, there are practical constraints. Uh, apart from the question of how we are evaluating it, which are these three different questions, we are instead going to be looking at a slightly different question of what are you actually evaluating, right? So what are you using the explanations for? Maybe we can divide evaluations based on that. So one reason you might be uh, using explanations is just for a user to understand the behavior. Another one could be the fact that explanations can be useful for debugging. And finally, explanations can also help you make decisions, right? Um, so in some sense, these three things are very different from the ones that, are, that ask about how we evaluate it. So you can imagine it as a conceptual matrix where any combination of these may be a potential candidate for evaluation. So uh, in this section, I'm gonna be focusing mostly on uh, what we are evaluating rather than how we are evaluating it. And I'm going to just give an example of each of these so that people understand. So with the first one, um, the question is whether the user understands the behavior from the explanations, or if you don't have a user, then the question is, does the explanation correspond to what the, hum the model actually does? So, one of the main questions when it comes up is, well, if you're selecting features and telling uh, and, and sort of claiming that they're important or not important, 
how can we make sure that the features that are selected are actually important to the model? One way to do that is to just delete the most important features um, and see what happens, right? Uh, and so the idea is you would start with an image like this, which has some saliency map that has identified important pixels in this case. And you will essentially plot the prediction probability coming out of the model as you delete the most important features, right? So you identify the most important features, um, delete it and see what happens to the probability. Take the next most important feature, delete it, see what happens to the probability. And you essentially continue doing this uh, till some point. And in some cases, uh, people do it all the way um, till your whole image is um, basically deleted and you get your final prediction probability, right? And looking at this curve, you can judge whether the explanation was useful or not, or corresponds to the model behavior or not. Because if it is a good explanation, then this probability should fall down really fast. And if it's a bad explanation, the probability should not fall down that fast, right? And that way you can decide whether the explanation is good or not. Uh, people have, not that many, but people have also done the inverse of this, where they're trying to see if we can add the most important features, uh, does the probability go up really fast, right? So you would start with an empty image um, and you're going to add some stuff to it, uh, like the most important features according to your explanation and see what the prediction probability is. And you will keep doing that uh, till you have you know, some natural stopping point, or maybe you'll keep doing that till your whole image is present and you'll get some curve, right? And again, in this case, you have a good explanation where this probability increases really fast because um, of all the features that are important that you've added. Um, and if this curve doesn't increase very fast, that means you're adding features that the model doesn't really care about. Um, and so that's a bad explanation. It doesn't correspond to the um, model. What has also been interesting is that this idea has also been used for training data. So if you remember, uh, Julius talked about uh, influential training points. Some explanations try to find those. You can also add or remove them from the training data and retrain the model and essentially plot the prediction probability to do the same thing. So here's an example from a paper last year um, where they're removing a fraction of the training data, uh, but the order in which they're removing depends on importance coming from the explanation and seeing what the validation accuracy is. And if this curve falls down really fast as it seems to be for this blue curve, that's a better explanation or at least a better representation of what's happening inside the model. And they again have an insertion version where they're adding the most influential training points, retraining it and seeing how the accuracy goes up. So these were sort of one way of evaluating the behavior. Here's another one that is pretty common um, where you're trying to train the users to predict the behavior of machine learning models. It's also been called simulation in, in by a few papers, and I'm giving some examples of where these things take place. The idea here is you have some data um, and some classifier that you're trying to uh, evaluate, and you get the predictions and explanations for this data from the classifier. A bunch of predictions falls through, falls through, and then an explanation, whatever explanation technique you want to evaluate. And you actually show these things to a user. Here's a prediction, here's an explanation. They have some time just to look at a bunch of them. And they, the idea is for them to understand what the model, how the model behaves. Then what you do is you give them new data points. Uh, don't show them the prediction, don't show them the explanation, just give them new instances and ask them to guess what the classifier would do on this new data set. Uh, and all they know about the classifier is through the predictions and the explanations. Um, they make their guesses. What you do is you run the classifier on this new data, get the actual prediction of, from the classifiers and compare the guesses with the actual prediction and compute an accuracy. And this, this tells you how well the user understands the classifier. Um, if they're really accurate at this, then they've been able to simulate the classifier and therefore the explanations must be, uh, must be useful. Here's an example of how it was used, um, where this is sort of what the UI looks like. This is a regression problem. So what do you think the model will predict? You give them a 
uh, they have to make a guess and then they also have to talk about how confident they are and those both of those things are incorporated in the evaluation okay so that was how a couple of examples of how to understand the behavior of the models um, let's talk about how we can use these explanations for debugging and essentially how that is a way to evaluate these explanations uh, there are four different ways of doing this i'm going to sort of quickly walk through what they look like um, in a lot of these cases the goal is to create a buggy classifier um, so in this case that's what this this bug on a classifier represents and what you want to know is is the user able to figure out what this bug is um, so you synthetically create these buggy classifiers or somehow you know that there is a bug in there. Uh, what you do then is you run the classifier through your explainer, generate either a bunch of explanations or whatever you need to do, um, show those, all of them to the user. And then you ask them. Um, so here's an example of what that would look like. You can um, take the snow example and the wolf example that we talked about a long time ago. Um, where the explanations are showing that the classifier is only looking at the snow, you show this to the user. You say, hey, for this image, the classifier predicts wolf, but this is what the explanation looks like. And then you ask users things like, would you trust this model? Right? And you basically measure how often they say no, because if they know it's looking at the snow, they shouldn't trust it too much. Second question you can ask them is, what, is, what do you think the classifier is doing? just as a free text explained to us. Uh, and then you can read it and evaluate whether they got it right or not, right? whether they mentioned snow or anything like that. This is one way to see whether the explanations show you what's going wrong with the uh, classifiers. Here's another way, which is a little bit easier to evaluate where you give, um, you create two classifiers. One of them is a clean classifier. The other one is a buggy classifier. You run both of them through your explainer, get two explanations and show both of them to the users, often side by side. Um, so here's an example of, uh, oh, sorry, yeah. And then you basically ask them, given these two explanations, which algorithm do you think is better? And you see how often they picked the clean one versus the buggy one. The more often they pick the clean one, the better the explanation is because the user is able to evaluate how good a, a model is. Uh, using just explanations. Uh, so as an example, you can start with the wolf snow image again, and the explanations you would generate would look something like this, where the clean classifier is actually looking at the, the wolf, the snout, the ears, and the fur, and so on, whereas the buggy classifier is looking at the snow. The user should be able to look at these two and say, okay, clearly the first one is better and not the second one. Um, the third way to sort of use these explanations for debugging can be thought of as fixing it or actually improving the, um, the classifier. You can't always do this because of how feature engineering works or I guess doesn't, is often not present nowadays, uh, but you can do that sometimes. So what you can do is you can take a buggy classifier. Um, so for example, you can do NLP where there are some words that the classifier seems to be focusing on and those are just noisy words that should be just removed. Um, you run it through an explainer and you show the user the explanations. And in some sense, you get feedback from the users by asking them, what do you think looks wrong in this explanation? What do you disagree with? What features are, is the model looking at that you wouldn't want it to look at? And you incorporate this feedback somehow into the training process. So for example, you could just remove the features that they think it looks wrong. Right? Some way to sort of change your training objective or change your model uh, to do that. And you can sort of iterate over it. You don't have to do this just once. You get a new classifier. You can run through this again and essentially compute the accuracy of the classifier on some held out data that you trust, um, that you think is clean. Um, and you show that the accuracy is going up. So even though the user may not know feature engineering directly, may not know much about machine learning, they're still able to annotate these explanations to give you a better classifier. Um, the last way of using explanations for debugging can be thought of as finding errors in the training data. Um, so in this case, this mostly applies to prototypical explanations or when it's sort of influence-based stuff. Um, 
where the explanation is trying to find important instances from the training data. In this case, you can start with the training data, the original clean training data, and then add a bunch of instances that are deliberately wrong, right? So you can even take a bunch of instances from the original training data and just flip their classes, whatever you need to do. Run this through your classifier, run this through your explainer, and remember the explainer here is one that finds important points from the training data. So you show the users the most important points and you essentially ask them to relabel it, right? You, you say, okay, here were the most influential points, uh, relabel it. And I guess the hope is that if the explainer is accurate, is correct, um, clearly the noisy uh, instances will have a big impact on the classifier and therefore they should show up higher in this ranking. Uh, and then you can just evaluate, were the ones that were added, the noisy ones, were they the ones that were selected by the explainer? Um, and does the accuracy go up when you relabel those points, right? So even though I have a human here, you can imagine easily automating, automating this whole thing where uh, you just look at the highest ranked ones and put the correct label in there. Okay, so these were ones where we were you know, using explanations for debugging. The last section I have is helping them make decisions. Um, so the question here is, are the explanations useful in any way for humans to make better decisions than just using an AI? Um, so mostly you want to use this when the algorithms are not reliable by themselves or you wouldn't want them to uh, make the decisions. And there's a paper here by Lai and Tan, which does a really good job of sort of talking about this, not as a binary, are you using explanations or not, but has a huge, uh, has a whole spectrum going from full human agency that's not using any machine learning all the way to full automation, where it's just an AI algorithm making uh, decisions with a bunch of points in between where there is sort of a collaboration going on. Uh, and specifically for explanations, those are the two points in the middle that come up, whether um, when you show explanations and still ask the user to make a decision, uh, are they able to do that or not? Are they able to do that better than without explanations? So here's an example of how it was applied uh, for deception detection, where the goal is to identify fake reviews online uh, by reading them. And this is a pretty difficult uh, problem, even for AI agents, um, where it's not always obvious what is a fake review. It could be just an enthusiastic review, um, which may not necessarily be fake. So the question is, are the humans better deception detectors uh, when they have explanations or not? And so this is sort of what the interface looks like to the experiments that they ran. Um, they have a review down there, but instead of asking the user to read the whole review, they have sort of highlighted a few words um, that their explanation technique thinks is important. Um, and maybe the users will look at those, maybe they'll focus on those words and they'll be more informed about whether this is a genuine or a deceptive review, right? And of course, once they label it, uh, if it's coming from a data set, you know whether it's um, genuine or deceptive and you can quickly compute an accuracy of um, how good um, how good the explanation was in can being useful to the uh, user. Uh, here's a slightly different way of thinking about how uh, explanations might help users. Uh, this is an idea that I've seen in uh, some papers by Yisong Yu, uh, but, but a lot of people have discussed these things, where the goal is to understand the task, right? So as a human, you want to learn how to differentiate butterflies today. Um, and here are some examples of butterflies that are labeled. And maybe after looking at a few of these, you'll be able to figure out what a queen uh, butterfly looks like and what a red admiral looks like. But maybe you won't be able to differentiate between monarch and viceroy so much. Um, and maybe I can show you thousands of examples, but that's time consuming and boring. Um, instead, what you can do is you can train a machine learning classifier that's really accurate at this task. Um, and by default, you don't know why it's accurate. It still can't tell you the difference between two things. Um, but what you can then do is look at the explanation. Um, so this is sort of what the explanation uh, of these um, 
these classify classifications looks like. Um, and given this classification, you can say, okay, the queen uh, butterfly seems to have these white spots that the model is looking at. The red admiral has this bar of orangey thing. Uh, and Viceroy has a certain pattern that seems to distinguish it from a monarch butterfly, right? So you're using explanation techniques to learn about the task uh, using the machine learning model as a proxy or as a teacher, uh, rather than uh, using it for prediction or anything specific like that. Um, and so the idea is you can compare different explanations and see which one makes you a better butterfly differentiator. Right? Okay. Um, so that's pretty much what we ha what I have in terms of categories and uh, different kinds of evaluations people have done. Again, in no way comprehensive, but hopefully gives you a good idea of how people do automated and human and all kinds of things in between as well. Um, I do want to end with some limitations of evaluating explanations. There are many, but I'm going to focus on a few. Uh, one of the most important limitations is that the evaluation setup is usually quite simple or quite easy. Uh, and, and most of the time they highlight how, how much the explanations can help. Uh, and so they're deliberately like the baselines are too simple sometimes, um, or sometimes they're just unrealistic. And, and your conclusions about those setups may not translate to a real world situation, right? So for example, every time I had a bug on my classifier, sometimes the artifacts that are added are very, very obvious ones. For example, even the snow and no snow is a good, good example of that. Um, or the classifiers that you're using are completely different from each other. So if you're comparing classifiers, you train a really simple one uh, and then a really complex one and you're trying to compare them. Um, Often when you're doing perturbations or creating instances and any of these kind of things like deleting stuff and inserting parts of an image, you end up creating out of domain images or out of domain points. Um, this is especially important or happens all the play all the time in NLP. And that causes uh, the causes the model to misbehave sometimes and you don't know whether your evaluation results are, are too um, Look, look the way they do because of that. Sometimes the evaluation can just be flawed fundamentally. I don't want to point to specific papers, but there are often cases where um, explanations that look good to humans are considered better explanations, even if, but, but that's not really measuring how uh, faithful the explanation is to what the model is doing. Um, so the model explanation need not be the same as a human explanation, but often these things get conflated together. Uh, it's also a little bit weird that there are quite a few automated metrics used in interpretability, because if you have automated metrics, you can often optimize them as well, because there is no true explanation here. Um, you can just sort of try to optimize whatever you're measuring. So insertion and deletion are good examples of this, where those are easy ones to sort of get an explanation such that deleting reduces the probability the most. You can easily do this. Uh, one of the biggest problem I have is that the user studies are not consistent. Not only, I mean, they may be consistent within one contribution, but when you're talking about multiple papers and how things evolve over time, um, there are major issues here, right? Like there are, these user studies can be affected by so many different things. They can be affected by what the UI was, how did you phrase the question, what the visualization of the explanation was, which population you were evaluating on, how much were the incentives if you're doing crowdsourcing. Um, there's so many things that could affect your results. Um, and we as machine learning researchers are not really trained for this, unfortunately. Um, so I feel we do a pretty shoddy job of, uh, of being consistent, doing consistent user studies that are reliable. And, and so because of all of these things, what ends up being the case is that um, often the conclusions that one paper makes about an interpretability technique um, makes it difficult to generalize across beyond the setup that you actually use. So when you say our explanation technique worked better, I, the, the way to think about this is it worked better in the specific experiment setup you had with the specific user study, the way it was designed. And it's not always obvious how much you can take those and generalize. Um, so yeah, sorry to end at a bit of a downer, but 
a uh, lot of exciting stuff here to do that that should be the message here uh, rather than thinking that uh, uh, this is sort of a, a downer for the field yeah so all right uh, now we'll switch to uh, limits of post hoc explainability so now we'll now discuss limits of post hoc explainability So we'll start with a discussion on faithfulness slash fidelity, fragility, stability, and whether explanations are actually useful in practice. So let's start with faithfulness. So let's say we're given a model F theta. In this case, think of it as an inception V3 model, ResNet 50 that was being trained on ImageNet. And the prediction of this model on this input is that it's a Junko bird. And as we've discussed before, we're interested in interpretation or explanations from derived from this model about this particular prediction. So let's say we compute a saliency map from this for this particular input. And now one question we might be interested in it is whether this saliency map really reflects the associations and the behavior that this model has learned. And specifically in this case, this is a question about whether the parts of the saliency maps that are sort of strongly highlighted, the features that are highly relevant, are they really the ones that this model is relying on to classify that this bird is a Junko bird? And so this question is really one of faithfulness. And for a postdoc explanation method, this one, this is a question that is very critical because an explanation method that is faithful to the model that's been explained then can be sort of relied upon to provide useful insights. As we'll see shortly, separate explanation methods are actually not faithful to the model that they're purportedly explaining. And so one way to assess faithfulness is to sort of measure the sensitivity of the explanation method to sort of the parameter settings of a model. And so to make this more concrete, consider two different models one, an Inception V3 or a ResNet 50 model that is trained normally on ImageNet. And another one, parameter setting two here, where we've reinitialized the weights in the top layer of this Inception V3 or ResNet model. And then we can get the predictions from this model. And for a normally trained model, we get that it's correct, a Junko bird. And the partially reinitialized model, we get that it's a corn. And as expected, because the weights of the top layer have been reinitialized. Now, um, the sanity check here is that we would expect that the explanation that we derive from the first model should be different from the explanation that we derive from the second model if the explanation method in question is indeed sensitive to the parameters of the model being explained. So let's look at a concrete example. Let's look at the guided backprop saliency explanation on an Inception V3 model. We can compute. Uh, this visualization to get it back from one for the normal model and for this particular input. And we get this visualization. We can reinitialize the top layer weights and then we compute the same explanation. And what we get seems visually indistinguishable from the normal model. And so what we can do now is we can continue to reinitialize the weights of the model starting from the top layer all the way to the input. And what we notice is that guided back from is invariant to the higher layer weights of the model. This behavior of get it actually extends to a general class of methods called modified uh, backpropagation approaches. In a recent work, Six et al. studied this and were able to sort of theoretically show that these methods that are in some sense post-process the backpropagation process through uh, positive aggregation produce uh, visualizations or saliency maps that are invariant to the higher level weights. So the example shown here is a VGG16 model and a series of this different explanations. And we see that some of these methods, in particular the ones that are modified to get the backpropagation process with positive get ag aggregation, are invariant to the higher level weights. So like guided backprop, detailer decomposition, two variants of the layer relevance propagation, pattern net and pattern attribution, these methods are invariant as we see to the higher level weights. And so the source of this invariant has also been studied in the literature. For the case of get it back from and decomnet, a work from ICML in 2018 showed that both these methods are essentially reconstructing the input 
And then uh, more generally for the modified backprop approaches, uh, six et al. in ICML of this year, where theoretically showed that these methods that modify backpropagation to compute feature relevance while also performing positive aggregation along the way converts to a rank one matrix, hence the variance that we actually see in practice. And some of those methods are actually widely used, which sort of speaks to the importance of really taking the fidelity and the faithfulness of an explanation method very seriously. So not every explanation method is invariant. And in, we can sort of repeat this experiment of cascading reinitialization of the weights for an inception V3 model for a variety of other explanation methods and for methods like the gradient, smooth grad, integrated gradients, and grad cam that we've seen before. These methods undergo substantial changes um, as the parameters of the model are being reinitialized. So now this concludes our discussion on faithfulness. Let's now move to fragility. The key takeaway from our discussion on fragility would be that post hoc explanations can be easily manipulated. So let's look at an example that's sort of derived from the work of Dombrovsky et al. in 2019. And so consider this original image. You can compute a saliency map for it and obtain an image as so. And then you can manipulate this image in an adversarial fashion that we'll discuss shortly. And generate an explanation that is completely manipulated. However, in this case, the prediction of the model on these two images are exactly the same. And so you can also perform what is a scaffolding attack where you can train a model to completely rely on the gender for a particular data set. And so this is sort of artificially injecting bias. And in a scaffolding attack of Slack and Hilda, they were able to sort of hide the bias of the model from a line and a sharp method, indicating that you can sort of mislead um, po uh, postdoc explanations very deliberately. And so let's look at an example of how one, we, one would compute uh, an example perturbation. And so we're looking at a formulation due to Gorbani et al. And here the, the game is to sort of take an input and then add some form of perturbation to it. And this perturbation would be such that the explanation, the distance between the explanation between the inputs and another input that the perturbation has been added to would be maximized. Whereas the perturbation you're adding should be small in some norm here, it's L infinity norm. And uh, crucially, you also want to maintain that a prediction should be the same. And here, this is essentially the formulation. And this formulation can be um, solved or optimized in the same similar ways analogous to how adversary examples are computed. So there are several other attacks. There's a shift attack of Kindermans and Hooker. There's the Dombrowski, Dombrowski um, attack that was seen earlier. And so one takeaway from here is that almost every explanation method that we discussed in this tutorial can be easily manipulated. And this is a, the, the ease of manipulation of explanations is a challenge and work, uh, there hasn't been a lot of work in this area, but one work that I sort of try to propose a defense uh, is work by Anders et al from ICML 2020. And they proposed two defenses, a hyperplane defense and auto encoded defense. And both of these defenses rely on sort of a low manifold assumption, which is that the data relies on a low manifold. And here an example of their defense. And so you have an original explanation that almost exclusively relies on gender. And then you can manipulate this explanation to sort of reduce the reliance on gender onto income and taxes. However, if you employ their defense, you can recover an explanation that sort of recovers the original explanation without manipulation. And so this is an example of an emergent defense and this area actually uh, needs additional work so that we can sort of better defend postdoc explanations. So now let's move to stability. And the limitations and stability have to deal with the fact that sometimes small non-adversarial perturbations to inputs that are being explained can lead to wild changes in the inputs. And this question was studied by Alvarez et al. in 2018. And there's been subsequent work along this direction as well. And 
one way to sort of measure the stability of an explanation function is to measure what Alvarez at all call a local Lipschitz constant. And here, this is similar to uh, a traditional Lipschitz constant in the sense that you estimate the Lipschitz constant of an explanation function like lime, sharp, or the gradient method around a local instance. And here, um, intuitively, we can see that if the Lipschitz constant of an explanation function is very high, then it means the explanation is unstable. And so we can sort of empirically sort of assess the Lipschitz constants of various different explanation methods. And the finding here from Alvarez et al. is that perturbation methods like Lyme can be unstable in practice. In recent work of Ye et al. at NERPS 2019, they were able to analytically derive bounds on the sensitivity and the fidelity of several different explanation methods and also propose stable variants. So one additional insight that has come of late is that explanation methods can be very sensitive to hyperparameters like random C, number of perturbations in the case of line, patch size in the case of um, different saliency map methods. And these are things that are not directly related to the model or the behavior of the model. And yet this, this hyperparameters uh, tend to highly affect the kind of explanation that is produced. And this kind of effect is something that is unwanted and one would want to avoid in an explanation method. So that concludes our discussion on stability. We can now move to a discussion of whether explanations are useful in practice. As we discussed earlier in the case of Lyme, explanations like Lyme was used to identify spurious signals in a, in a, training, in a training set of a model that was trained um, trained to sort of identify different animals. And here we can see that the Lyme is indicating that the model is relying on the snow background as opposed to the object in determining that the object is a wolf. In another case, an LRP variant was used to identify spurious correlation, spurious correlation signals in terms of captions on the Pascal VOC data set for horses. And so here the model is relying on the caption to determine that the object is a horse. Now, explanations have also been used in a variety of ways. Penalizing explanations during training has been shown to reduce reliance of the model on spurious correlation. In certain settings, this explanation, these models have been shown to be somewhat more robust to adversary examples. At the same time, other benefits involve sort of simulatability, the ability of an end user to forecast what the model output would be. And Table Online, for example, has been shown to improve forward and counterfactual simulatability. So what we've talked about so far are ways in which explanations have been shown to be useful. Now we can also look at other, uh, other recent papers that have shown that explanations are actually might not be as useful in practice as one would expect. So consider the case of a bail adjudication task. Here you can train a ruleless method that explicitly relies on race to determine bail adjudication. Now you can derive a high fidelity explanation that is also a ruleless from this classifier that doesn't show explicit dependence on race. And a user study was conducted comparing these two explanations and law school students were found to trust the high fidelity but misleading explanation sometimes by a factor of nine, which indicates that even high fidelity explanations can be misleading in practice. In another case, Amazon mechanical turpers were sort of tested in practice and asked to sort of debug an, a, mo a linear model that was trained to predict housing prices. And in this particular case, it was found that these Amazon mechanical turpers were not able to reliably use the coefficients of the linear model to actually debug outliers on identify errors. And this is a particularly devastating finding because as machine learning researchers, we think of linear models as very simple models that one can very easily debug. However, this is showing counter examples to that, that Amazon mechanical turkers, who, uh, we can also think of as lay um, users are not able to do this. In a recent paper, um, end users were shown saliency maps for a model for different models that were supposed to classify dogs into different breed classes. And here the option was that 
in the end users relied more on the labels instead of the saliency maps to identify models that have bugs. In a last case, in a recent work, Borowski and Zimmerman conducted a user study to sort of compare natural images with feature visualizations and identify images that sort of strongly activate a particular neuron. And here they would found that natural images were very helpful and more helpful than the feature visualizations for end users in sort of selected images that strongly activated intermediate neurons. So let's synthesize what we've learned so far. Initially, we've seen that explanations have been shown to be useful for sort of penalizing uh, spurious correlation and models learned by penalizing explanations have actually been useful in being sort of more robust to adversary examples. And there's also been utility in form of simulation. However, there's been several recent user studies and pilot studies as well that have shown that these explanations might actually not be as useful in practice as we would expect. And this is a sort of conflicting finding that calls for the field to be more careful and do more sort of rigorous user studies to identify when and for what specific task an explanation is useful. In addition, the, we can also identify for what specific population subgroup is in machine learning researchers, lay users. And so this kind of more rigorous user studies will help us delineate when explanations are useful and for what population and what task. So to summarize the limitations that we've discussed so far, we looked at uh, fidelity and faithfulness, fragility, stability, and whether explanations are useful in practice. Thank you. All right, now we are finally on to the last section of this talk. Here we are going to talk about the future of post hoc explainability, and I'm going to discuss some of the emerging topics in explainability research and also touch upon some interesting and pressing open problems in the field. We are going to structure this section into two parts or two subsections where the first subsection will focus on moving towards better post hoc explanations and the second subsection will focus on other emerging directions. Under the first umbrella, we'll discuss about methods for more reliable post hoc explanations, uh, theoretical analysis of post hoc explanation methods, uh, rigorous evaluation of the utility of post hoc explanations. And under the other emerging directions umbrella, we are going to talk about post hoc explainability beyond classification. For example, in settings like RL and craft neural networks, we are also going to discuss about intersections with other emerging fields like differential privacy and fairness. Let's begin this discussion by jumping into methods for more reliable post hoc explanations. As we have just discussed in the previous section, post hoc explanations have several limitations. First of all, they are not always faithful to the underlying model. They may be unstable and fragile. In order to fix some of these problems, there has been some recent work that focus on the following directions. The first one is modeling uncertainty in post hoc explanations. The second one is generating post hoc explanations that are stable as well as robust to distribution shifts. And the third one is generating causal explanations that are faithful to the underlying models. Let's explore each of this in a slight bit of detail. Let's start with modeling uncertainty in post hoc explanations. There has been some recent work which proposed Bayesian versions of Lime and Shap with closed form solutions. And in this case, the output basically looks like this, where we get feature importance intervals as opposed to just point estimates of feature importances so that the uncertainty in the explanation is captured better. These approaches are, of course, model agnostic, which means they don't need access to any of the internal details of the model they're trying to explain. And there is more. These approaches also generate post hoc explanations which satisfy user specified levels of confidence. For example, if a user is requiring an application where she says that the true feature importance should lie within 
plus or minus 0.5 of the estimated values with 95% confidence, these approaches can actually tackle that and basically produce explanations which satisfy user specified confidence levels. The next approach focuses on building post hoc explanations that are both stable and robust to distribution shifts. And it does so by leveraging Minimax objective and adversarial training to generate explanations that are both stable and robust. The intuition or the idea here is to basically choose an explanation which minimizes the worst case loss over a set of possible distribution shifts. And the loss here is computed as the mismatch between explanations, labels, and black box predictions. In fact, this framework is generic enough and can be instantiated to generate model agnostic local and global explanations of various types, for example, feature importances or routes. The third interesting approach along these lines is the one which generates faithful causal explanations. The idea here is to estimate the effect of or the causal effect of the presence or absence of a human interpretable concept on a deep neural nets predictions. And one can imagine that estimating such effects can get extremely hard, especially we can't easily turn on or off a given concept in a data point. For example, for example, if eyeglasses is the human interpretable concept for which we want to estimate causal effect, editing out eyeglasses from images can be non-trivial, right? But these folks, Goel et al., they propose a solution which leverage variational autoencoders to mitigate this problem and measure causal concept effects. Identifying vulnerabilities in existing post hoc explanation methods and proposing approaches to address these vulnerabilities is going to be a critical research direction going forward in the field. Now let's talk a little bit about theoretical analysis of post hoc explanation methods. There has been some very interesting work recently which does some theoretical analysis of Lyme under the assumption that the underlying predictive model or the black box is actually a linear model. And this work basically shows that they can obtain closed form solutions of the average coefficients of the surrogate model or explanation output by Lyme. Uh, further, they also show that the coefficients obtained are proportional to the gradient of the function to be explained. And lastly, and this is not so much of a good news, they also demonstrate that local error of surrogate model or explanation is bounded away from zero with high probability indicating some issues with the fidelity of explanations generated by line in the context of that they choose or work with. Uh, so again, this is a very critical and interesting result and more such analysis is absolutely required uh, for the future of this field. Theoretical analysis shedding light on the fidelity, stability, and fragility of post hoc explanation methods can be extremely valuable to the progress of this field. Lastly, let's talk a little bit about rigorous evaluations of the utility of post hoc explanations. There has been some recent research suggesting that domain experts and end users seem to be over trusting explanations and underlying models based on explanations. For example, it was demonstrated through user studies that law school students trusted underlying models 9.8 times more when shown a misleading explanation which whitewashes the model. And it was also shown that data scientists uh, were basically overly trusting explanations without even comprehending what they are. In fact, this paper has an interesting snippet which says that participants trusted the tools because of their visualizations and their public availability, which is also evidenced by some of the responses provided by them. If you look at the highlighted response, it clearly says, I do not fully grasp what SHAP values are. This is a pretty popular tool. I figure they were showing SHAP values for a reason anyway, so it made sense, I suppose. Now, this is quite alarming, and I think more of such studies need to be done to really understand the utility of explainability tools.
And there have also been other recent studies which tried to evaluate the effect of explanations on human AI collaboration, uh, in uh, particularly in sentiment analysis and question answering tasks. And what was found was that showing state of the art explanations, for example, those output by line, actually made little to no difference to the decision accuracy uh, when human and AI teams were collaborating to work on these tasks. And in fact, as shown by this particular graph, uh, showing the state of the art explanations, in fact, sometimes hurt the decision accuracy. Rigorous user studies and evaluations to ascertain the utility of different post hoc explanation methods in various contexts and settings is extremely critical for the progress of the field. Let's switch gears and talk about other emerging directions. Let's begin this discussion with post hoc explainability beyond classification. More recently, there has been a lot of exciting work on explainable RL. For example, some approaches have been proposed uh, which leverage model distillation techniques to understand RL policies. More specifically, one of the approaches actually utilizes soft decision trees, uh, which map input instances probabilistically to leaf nodes in order to map states to actions. Similarly, there has been another work which summarizes agent behavior by identifying important states in a policy. And a state, according to this work, is considered important if different actions from that state lead to substantially different outcomes. There is also some work on causal explanations to understand the behavior of model-free RL agents. The idea here is to generate explanations of agent behavior based on counterfactual analysis of the causal model. For example, here is basically some action of a StarCraft II agent. The agent has taken the action of build supply depot and the end user can ask a question like why not take another action build barracks and this particular approach will actually leverage causal model to answer a counterfactual question like that. Uh, beyond RL, there has also been some exciting work happening in explainability in the context of craft neural networks. For example, there has been a recent paper on GNN Explainer, which takes a trained graph neural network and its predictions and returns an explanation in the form of a small subgraph and a small subset of node features that are influential to a given prediction. For example, here you see a simple picture which captures two nodes VI and VJ and their corresponding predictions output by the GNNs, which is VI is labeled as basketball and VJ is labeled as sailing. And if you look at the explanation on the right hand side, what you see is that VI has a lot of friends who are interested in ball games. And so VI is assigned the label basketball and VJ has a lot of friends who are interested in water sports and hence VJ is assigned the label sailing. Lots of real world applications call for models and algorithms that go way beyond classification. There are several exciting opportunities now to explore explainability in these settings. Let's focus our attention on understanding intersections between uh, explainability and differential privacy. Explanations could potentially expose sensitive information from the data sets. Therefore, it's important to be very careful. And it also brings out the need for building explanations which not only are interpretable, but also guarantee differential privacy. And that's exactly what is being done by some of the recent approaches proposed in this regard. The idea here is to use locally linear models to approximate complex black box but also to perturb the gradients when learning these locally linear models in order to ensure differential privacy. Of course, this work barely scratches the surface and there is a clear need for more theoretical, methodological and empirical research exploring this intersection. Now let's talk about the intersections between explainability and fairness.
Uh, to this end, let's explore one of the approaches which has been proposed, which uses explainability uh, to think about biases or to detect biases. There's an approach called distill and compare, where the idea is to compare the transparent distilled down versions of a given black box risk scoring model and the true outcome model to detect biases in risk scoring models. So basically, you have a black box model. Uh, you basically approximate that using a transparent and simpler model. And then on the other side, you have the data and the actual outcomes. You train another similar, simpler interpretable model to capture those outcomes. And now you compare these two distilled down transparent models to understand what are the biases of this risk scoring black box. Right. So here explainability is being used as a means to actually detect biases. And there has actually been a lot of such work which uses explainability to detect biases. And it is, in fact, often commonly hypothesized that post hoc explanations can help with detecting model biases. However, there is a clear need for more rigorous theoretical and empirical studies to quantitatively evaluate this hypothesis. We also need to think about other deeper questions like can post hoc explanations actually help detect unfairness? If so, what kind of unfairness would that be? Does it really map to any of the existing statistical notions of unfairness? In addition, how does the unfairness that is detected by explanations, how does that complement existing statistical notions of unfairness? All these questions are relatively unexplored. There has also been some interesting recent work on fairness Shapley values, uh, which attributes unfairness in model predictions to individual features using the Shapley values framework. This work also demonstrates that for different definitions of fairness, it is possible to choose Shapley value functions which explain the unfairness. Again, the connections between explainability and fairness need to be explored more thoroughly, both through rigorous analysis as well as user studies. With that, we have completed our discussion on post hoc explanations. We covered a lot of ground in this tutorial today. We started off this discussion by motivating the need for explainability. We then presented several approaches for post hoc explainability, including local and global explanation methods. We also talked about how explanations can be constructed to target data from different modalities. We then presented our views and takes on evaluating explanation methods, and we also shed some light on the limits and future of post hoc explainability. We would like to leave you all with some parting thoughts. When introducing a new explanation method, it is important to clearly identify who the target end users are that the method will help. It's also important to include in your papers and research a clear statement about what capability or insight the new method aims to provide to its end users. It's also extremely critical to include a careful analysis and a clear exposition of the limitations and vulnerabilities of the proposed method. Rigorous user studies, preferably with actual end users, to evaluate if the method is achieving the desired effect are absolutely critical. Lastly, use of quantitative metrics and not just anecdotal evidence to make claims about explainability is extremely important to the progress of the field. With this, we would like to thank you all for your attention and your time. We hope you found this tutorial useful and insightful. We would like to explicitly acknowledge that explainability is a burgeoning field and there is a lot of exciting literature that is coming out. Unfortunately, due to time limitations, we could not include all the amazing papers out there in our tutorial, but we are providing a companion web page whose link is listed on this slide where we will include a more comprehensive list of references and other citations. We will also upload these slides and the video for this tutorial on the companion website. So please do check it out. Thank you so much again for your time and attention. Hope you have a great day.